Welcome to the Arkwright and Institution of Engineering and Technology Future of Green Energy Conference. Thank you so much for joining us. Today, you will be hearing from a number of professionals from across the engineering industry about their careers and the issues they're addressing. Later, we'll have a panel session with some former Arkwright scholars. We're also very happy to be joined by our keynote speaker, Chris Stark, who is the CEO of the Climate Change Committee. We will be giving you an overview of how the UK is addressing climate change. We hope that you will come away from today feeling inspired to continue your journey into engineering. During the event, you will be able to ask questions or upvote your favourite questions to all our main speakers and our panellists using Slido with the event hashtag Green Energy. Without further ado, I would like to introduce you to Dr Kevin Stenson, who is the CEO of the Small Peas Trust. Good morning. My name is Dr. Kevin Stenson, and I have the privilege of being the Chief Executive Officer of the Small Peace Trust, the education charity that administers the Arkwright Engineering Scholarship Programme. And as a result, I have the pleasure of welcoming you all to the inaugural The Bright Sparks Future of Green Energy online conference exclusively for Arkwright Engineering Scholars. And I should say that the Bright Sparks Future of Green Energy online conference has been specifically designed in response to a survey of scholars about what you see as the biggest challenge facing engineering today. So what can you expect to get out of this conference? Well, firstly, you will acquire knowledge about societal and engineering challenges regarding energy. Secondly, you will acquire knowledge about how engineering helps address these challenges. Thirdly, you will hear from and engage with engineers working at the leading edge of research and development. 
And fourthly, you will acquire an understanding of the opportunities that exist for each of you in the energy sector and what employers are looking for in future talent. As a result, we have a jam-packed morning planned for you. We have three company talks for you from leading companies in the energy sector, namely Ricardo, the Renewable Energy Group, and Energy Sprung. Now, during each of these talks, you will have the opportunity to pose questions to the speaker using Slido. Now, don't worry if you've not used Slido before, because one of our fantastic colleagues will provide you with a quick how-to introduction before you get to use Slido for the first time. And each of our speakers will take their questions at the end in a question and answer session. We also have a panel discussion for you about the future needs of employers. And this session is hosted by a number of inspirational RCRI Engineering Scholarship alumni who currently work in the energy sector, together with an equally inspiring former IET Young Engineer of the Year. Now this session, as I said, will provide you with a fantastic insight to the opportunities that lie ahead of each of you in engineering and what employers are looking for. And again, you will have the chance using Slido to submit questions for the question and answer session at the end of the discussion. We close out with the Institution of Engineering and Technology, the IET, the professional engineering institution that for the last 150 years has been inspiring, informing, and influencing the global engineering community to engineer a better world. And each of you are already part of this global engineering community. I should say that we've been incredibly fortunate that Chris Stark, the CEO of the Climate Change Committee, has agreed to start our conference today and to set the scene for all that follows. Thank you, Kevin, for that excellent introduction. I'm really pleased to introduce our next speaker, Chris Stark, who is the CEO of the Climate Change Committee, who are the UK's independent advisor on tackling climate change. Hi, everyone. So pleased to be able to speak to you today. I'm only sorry it has to be virtually. Um, I'm particularly pleased to be able to speak to a group of young, talented engineers. My team is tasked with advising on climate change and how we can tackle climate change. And I very much hope that the work we are doing is going to help you create some amazing new opportunities in engineering uh, in the future. So I wanted to say just a few words today about how I see all of that happening, the importance of climate change, and specifically the goal of net zero emissions, which you might have heard of. Uh, I'm going to try and encourage you to think today that this is an engineering challenge that you should be aware of and something that's going to matter in your lifetime. It's a tremendous opportunity, but also a tremendous responsibility. So we really have to get this right, and I'll explain that in just a second. Um, not just here in the UK, but right across the world. So net zero is the thing I'm going to talk about, and it's a term, an expression, uh, it's a slogan even that's come to mean many, many things in, to many, many people in the last few years. Uh, in technical terms, let me just explain what net zero is. So net zero is the point when emissions of greenhouse gases in, uh, to the atmosphere are balanced perfectly by the greenhouse gases that we can remove from the atmosphere. Now that's the scientific goal, and it's a really important one because it's the point when we will end our warming of the atmosphere and with it we can halt climate change. So hopefully you can see how important that is. It's quite a bit more though than just an emissions target. It's also very much a societal goal. So here in the UK where we do our work to meet net zero uh, is a law. Uh, and it means that over the next three decades, we're going to have to invest at a scale we've never invested before as a country. We're going to have to turn over the entire capital stock of our country from a largely high carbon basis to zero carbon. That implies something pretty fundamental. So a fundamental shift in every sector of our economy, in every region of the country, every industry. It also matters to lives in this country too. So we're moving away from fossil fuels to cleaner alternatives, fundamentally reimagining how energy is going to be provided and used in this country. So for you, at the very start of your engineering careers, in the midst of this pandemic, of course, as well, this is the wonderful thing about net zero. It's going to be a tool of renewal. 
It's going to require some really creative thinking. We're going to need to take an engineering mindset to fit all of the component parts of the net zero transition together. But it's also a behavioural and a cultural challenge. So we estimate in our work that 60% of the emissions reductions that we need to get to net zero in the UK involve some element of behaviour change. Nothing to be afraid of there at all, but we're going to need to engineer social and lifestyle change as, long as, as well as technology change too. So the key thing is that the transition to net zero is already upon us. This isn't some future endeavour that I'm talking about today. Net zero implies all of this change and achieving it by 2050 also happens to be the law of the land. So it's going to happen here and in other parts of the world and amazingly even places like China who've committed to net zero in the last year. So for all of you thinking about your career in engineering, whether that's here in the UK or elsewhere in the world, welcome to the dominant theme of your career. Over the time that you move from school to university and into work, we will move decisively away from fossil fuels to the zero carbon alternatives. It's really exciting to think that way about it. This is going to be a period when we will substantially electrify the economy. Uh, and alongside that, we'll be introducing some brand new energy sources like hydrogen. We're going to need to capture carbon from the atmosphere or from fossil fuels if we continue to use them. We're going to need to store that carbon safely in geological storage, probably under the sea uh, here in the UK. This is going to be a period when all of that happens and when we will rewrite fundamentally the long-held conventions about how energy is going to be supplied and used, how we use smart technologies that use renewable energy uh, when the wind blows or when the sun shines and store, it, and store that energy for use later too. So all of that change is happening over the coming years and the old dividing lines between the transport sector and the power sector or the heat sector or the industry sectors, they're all going to be blurred by that change, by this challenge of decarbonisation. So we're going to need some really fresh engineering insights and thoughts about how we drive that transition in a genuinely integrated way. Your car in the future might be the energy store for wind energy. Uh, instead of a gas boiler in your home, you might be using a heat pump to heat it up with software that tells it when to use those zero carbon electrons to heat it cheaply. Uh, we'll need to invest heavily and build new zero carbon industries right across the UK and right throughout the world. That's the thrill of it for me. It's a fundamental shift, one that we know we can do now, which is really exciting. And of course, one that we know we must do as well. So just think about the huge opportunities that are going to be for you to move into those new areas, the huge skill gaps that you're going to help to fill. My organisation, the Climate Change Committee, has just published our latest assessment of how the UK journey to net zero looks. It's going to look very similar to other developed rich economies around the world. Instead of targets, what we've tried to do with our most recent work is to focus on the transition itself, the changes that we'll see, the things that we need to actually deploy to cut greenhouse gas emissions uh, across the economy over the next 30 years. So just a few things I can tell you about that transition here in the UK. Firstly, it's big. We're talking about decarbonising 30 million buildings, 40 million vehicles on our roads, doubling, possibly even tripling the size of the electricity sector in the UK, building a hydrogen sector alongside it from almost nothing to something that's 10 times what we have today. Um, we have a good understanding of the technologies and the strategies that can drive that. They're all perfectly feasible. And we're going to need to start to lay out the dates, crucially, by which we start to phase out those high carbon things and start phasing in the zero carbon alternatives. Those dates are surprisingly close. So the average car on the road is uh, on the road for 14 years. The average gas boiler is in use for 18 years. In reality, the crucial point for you is that by the time we reach the early 2030s in this, in this country, Every new heating installation, every new car, every new piece of machinery in, in industry, every new home that's constructed is going to need to be zero carbon. Just think about that. This is the decade, therefore, when the plans are going to be drawn up, when the government policies are going to be made. And from the 2030s onwards, we'll be rolling out those new solutions at scale. So I hope that's going to be the arc of your career too. There really hasn't been a period like it. So as you're probably picking up, 
I am tremendously optimistic about what lies ahead, tremendously optimistic about actually achieving net zero. I don't say that because of my belief in the current set of politicians, believe it or not. I mainly say it because the fundamentals of decarbonisation are moving in the right direction. The costs and the economics get better and better each year. So it looks less and less like a painful transition, more and more like something we want to do on a straightforward basis because it's the sensible choice, regardless of your views on climate change. Uh, the alternatives to fossil fuels are now plummeting in price. Here in the UK, offshore wind is now the cheapest form of electricity generation, bar none. That's our zero carbon energy source for the future. It's all a recipe for huge disruption, positive disruption, obviously in the energy sector, but also in other sectors like car manufacturing and other sectors too. So you will be the engineers and the leaders that will take us through this remarkable period. I hope you're going to make it your ambition to really grab net zero as a goal, make it your own. We're going to need you to challenge some of the crusty thinking that we still come across in the engineering community. I need you to help me clear a path to some fresh insights for how we achieve this transition as quickly as possible. And I'll just finish by saying thanks. Thanks to you, of course, and thanks to the IET for considering the climate issues. They are so important. I genuinely believe you're entering one of the most dynamic, exciting fields there is right now. And I hope you're going to make the most of the opportunities as we decarbonise over the next three decades. So thank you very much and best of luck. Thank you, Chris, for that excellent summary. And we're now ready to start the event. Our first speaker will be Olivia Carpenter Lomax, who is the chair of the IET Energy Sector Executive Committee, and in her day job is a principal consultant engineer at Ricardo Energy and Environment. Don't forget, you'll be able to log on to Slido and enter our event hashtag, hashtag green energy to ask her any questions. Hi everyone, I'm Olivia and I'm going to talk to you about my role as an energy systems engineer. I'm going to tell you a little bit about what I do and the kind of challenges that the energy systems are facing at the moment. And then I'm also going to tell you about how I got into the role and if you're interested, how might you might do the same. So I'm actually an engineering consultant, so that means I do a really wide range of projects for, for lots of different customers. I work for Ricardo Energy Environment and not all of my colleagues are engineers. I also work with geographers and environmental scientists and analysts and chemists who work in all sorts of sectors like air quality and water health and, uh, and um, sustainable transport. But of course, I work in the energy sector and in energy systems. And my role really is about making energy systems all over the world smarter and greener and more connected and more efficient. I do quite a wide range of projects from really technically specific uh, focused projects involving lots of data and analysis and design through to quite broad projects about the future of the energy sector and how to make it greener and more efficient for everyone. But here's a little bit about what I actually do day to day, because not all of my role is about actually doing those projects. A large chunk of it is, of course. Um, but I also talk to my clients and my customers a lot to make sure they're up to date with what I'm doing and to make sure the solutions I'm, I'm producing are really effective for them. I lead people. I'm, I lead a team of young engineers and uh, consultants, and my job is about making sure that they have everything they need to do their job well and that also that they are developing for their futures. I also lead projects, I'm a project manager as, as well as carrying out projects, which means that I'm in charge of managing tasks and budgets and project teams to make sure that the projects are delivered really successfully. And of course, I can't lead projects unless we win projects. Um, so a chunk of my job is about bidding new work. Um, so I make pitches to potential clients or respond to problems that they might uh, tell us that they have to try and produce good solutions that that they want us to deliver for them. And in practice, this really means that lots of my job is sitting in front of a computer or talking, collaborating with various people. I don't spend a lot of time out on site, but that's not always been the case. I've had previous roles where I spent every day in overalls and a hard hat 
which was also a lot of fun. And lots of different engineering jobs have lots, lots of different things that, that they do every day. OK, let's talk about the energy sector. There's a lot happening in the field of energy, and hopefully you'll have heard about the drive towards decarbonisation um, and making things more environmentally friendly. Uh, and that really is a driver for lots of the change that's happening in the energy sector. So we have a big challenge around renewable energy. And of course, renewable, renewable energy is fantastic. Uh, generating electricity from wind and solar um, means that we can really decarbonise our power sector. But our whole power sector is built around generation that is really controllable. So that means that when you turn on your lights or your kettle, the energy is there whenever you need it, because there's a generation unit somewhere that, that has had to uh, generate that electricity in real time. If we are going to adopt lots and lots of renewable energy, that means suddenly we have to rethink the whole way that we plan our energy system and operate our plan energy system so that we can um, so that we can use energy when it exists, when the wind is blowing and, and when the sun is shining, um, and we can uh, still allow for times when it's not. So big challenges require big solutions. And in this case, the big solution is at least partly around smarter, more connected energy systems. Um, it's about having, uh, having um, uh, storage, having energy storage or appliances or electric vehicles that are controllable and adaptable um, that can really leverage and make the most out of energy when it exists and conserve energy when it doesn't. And that in itself can go a long way to solve this big challenge. Let's look at another big challenge outside of electricity, uh, the electricity sector, because of course not all energy is about electricity. We have heat, we have transport and freight um, and industrial energy. Um, and to decarbonise those sectors, uh, we have to think about solutions that really work for them. And of course, one of the big solutions here is simply electrification. So moving from fossil fuel cars to electric vehicles, uh, installing highly efficient heat pumps to heat homes rather than using gas. And that is a, a really effective way of decarbonising these sectors because it means that uh, as we decarbonise the power sector, we're also decarbonising these sectors as well. But it's not a solution that works for everything. If you're going to fly to Australia, we don't have the battery technology at the moment that means we can do that uh, using electricity. So we have to think of alternative decarbonised fuels. And I'll just do one more big challenge, um, which is about the amount of infrastructure that we have in the country and all over the world. So old buildings, energy um, infrastructure, lots of infrastructure that exists that is inefficient and really not set up for this connected smart future. So we need to think of really good retrofit solutions that are suitable for those applications and that are tailored to each of those applications, but that can work together in this connected future um, as a whole system. And that way we can try and make sure that we can use as much of this infrastructure as possible and as little as possible is left behind. So I wanted to talk about how actually engineering solutions isn't, aren't just about considering the, the technology of solutions. The society and environment and economy are also really important aspects if we're going to have successful engineering solutions that really work in the real world. So, of course, society is, is really an obvious one. All of our solutions should be built to see, suit the needs of society um, now and in the future. Uh, but we really need to understand the needs of the whole of society. So that includes vulnerable people, people of different needs, different preferences, um, people all over the world, not just, not just people who are local to the solution itself. We need to make sure that uh, it serves the needs of all of those people and certainly doesn't um, impact any of them negatively. We've talked a little bit about environment already, so the need to decarbonise um, is a real driver for lots of what we do and all of our individual solutions, we need to consider the carbon impact. But there are other aspects to environment as well. So ecosystems, water health, um, the health of land and air and oceans, we need to understand um, all of those issues and at the very least minimise our impact on, on those aspects. 
um, but preferably really have a beneficial impact um, environmentally. And then the last one, economy, we, we can't have solutions that don't work financially and economically. We, uh, and lots of the world economies are built around um, current industries, lots of which are very um, detrimental to the environment. And if they're expected to change those, we have to be really careful about how that transition is made to make sure that uh, people and societies and countries aren't suffering. But of course, there's a really positive side to this as well, because the green transition will create jobs and industries and opportunities. So it's certainly not all, all a negative story there. I wanted to talk you through an example. Um, so let's talk about shipping. And shipping is one of those hard to decarbonize areas that I talked about earlier. Shipping is really important. So there is lots of goods and food and raw materials that are shipped around the world in vast quantities. And it's what drives our economies and gives us access to um, things that we can buy and do that we wouldn't otherwise be able to do. But of course, our ships are all fueled with um, fossil fuels, so diesel or heavy fuel oil, usually, uh, which are really detrimental to the environment. So we are trying to come up with um, alternatives and the shipping sector have been working on this for a, a little bit of time. And one of the really promising alternatives is hydrogen. Hydrogen, which can be generated in this case from renewable electricity and then either used directly in ships where, where applicable or sometimes reacted with other things to make a more energy dense fuel that can then be used in ships. And that's really great. So we've got a fuel that is generated from renewable electricity and water and can be entirely decarbonized. But unfortunately, the, the story is not always that simple. So if we imagine we're in a country where we don't have 100 percent access to electricity, which is the case in lots of places over the world where there are people who simply don't have, have access to electricity or, or at least not all the time. So is it OK to build wind farms and solar farms to generate electricity to turn into shipping fuel when your local people don't have access to electricity? When you have ships, you, you have hospitals that don't have refrigeration for drugs and for vaccines and when local school children are doing their homework by the light of candles. There might be other priorities for these countries. And there's another issue that we might have limited space for, for those renewable technologies. So wind farms and solar and uh, lots of the renewable technologies require space to install. And what if most of your country is covered with rainforest? Can you cut down that rainforest to put your solar panels to generate fuel for your ships? What about the carbon impact and the ecological impact of cutting down those rainforests? Is it really worth it? And then finally, what if your local economy is based around fossil fuels? What does it mean for the individuals who uh, depend on that as an income and the nations that depend on that to fund their services? That transition has to be considered really carefully. So you can see it's, it's not all quite so simple as we might hope. And of course, there are alternatives from, um, to hydrogen from renewables. There are um, other ways of producing hydrogen from actually from fossil fuels, but there are carbon impacts of that that can't be 100 percent mitigated with, with the technology we have at the moment. Or you can use fuels that are based on biomass, but um, so biomass that can be grown as a crop. But if that crop would otherwise be um, food feeding local populations, you've then got a trade off of what that land should be used for and, and what our priorities are. So you can see that none of the solutions are necessarily perfect for all applications. And really, the best solution might be to change the application, uh, change the solution for different places and different applications. But you have to do all of that by considering the wider context, not just the technology, but society and the environment and the economy as well. OK, so now I'm going to talk to you about how I became an engineer um, and also uh, other ways of becoming an engineer, if that's a, something that interests you.
So how I did it, I studied maths and science A-levels. I did physics, which was important for the type of engineering I wanted to do. Um, and actually, I didn't know anything about engineering uh, when I started my A-levels. It was one of my physics teachers that suggested to me that I wanted, I could do engineering and it was something that he thought I might enjoy doing. And that was only a few months before I applied for university places. So when I got to university, I studied general engineering, um, which is a really useful thing for me because it meant that I could do lots of different types of engineering um, and could try out the ones that I thought I might like. Um, particularly useful for me as I didn't know much about what engineering was. Um, I then got to specialise in later years. So uh, in my third year, I specialised in mechanical and electrical engineering. And in my fourth year, I, I um, specialised in new and renewable energy, which is how I've ended up in the role that I'm in. Um, I did a combined master's, so that's a, that's a four year course at university. And in my final year, I, like many people in their final year at university, was applying for lots of jobs so that I could go into a job um, at the end of my course. And I ended up getting a job at a utility and they offered a graduate scheme. So this graduate scheme was really beneficial. It meant that I could do lots of jo jobs for just a few months each and I could understand um, how different areas of the sector worked and different areas of the, of the company work. And the graduate, graduate scheme also included a few courses on things like leadership and safety and communication and all of those really important skills that aren't necessarily pushed at university. I then got a permanent role with that utility and worked there for, for a while. Uh, and I then decided that I wanted to move to consulting. And that was for a few reasons, but really the main reason was around the variety of work that I get to do as a consultant. I get to work in all different sectors all over the world for all different customers and I can be doing several projects at the same time and different projects week to week, which I find for me really exciting. And then a few years into my career, I applied to become chartered with the IET. Becoming a chartered engineer um, is something that's thought of quite highly within the sector. Um, and is something that's very useful to support my development, uh, both technically and also uh, the broader skills that are needed for engineering. So it's not just about proving uh, your technical skills, but it's also demonstrating your experience in leadership, project leadership, communication, um, uh, environmental um, aspects of your job as well. So there's lots of really important other aspects that chartership supports the development of. But that's just my journey. There are lots of other ways to become an engineer and there are lots of different engineers you can be. You can be an aeronautical engineer, a chemical engineer. You could be a mechanical engineer, a software engineer, an environmental engineer. There's lots and lots of different engineering disciplines. Um, so generally a good start is to study maths and science um, at, at school. Um, but there are other subjects that might also be useful. Anything that involves computing and programming is, is a useful skill. Um, design, um, if, if your school offers electronics um, or uh, anything around uh, technology, those kinds of subjects can be really useful. So, of course, I went to university um, and that's a common route for, for engineers, but increasingly there are options to have apprenticeships with companies um, and that's, that's becoming quite popular um, and there's a, that's a, a really beneficial way of learning on the job and learning the skills you need for the actual job that you want to go into. And then once you do go into a job, if, you're, if you have gone to university, um, going into a job after that um, could involve uh, doing some work experience. Um, so to really understand which job you want to go into. Um, you could go into a graduate scheme, as I did, and there are lots of different graduate schemes that do very different things. So mine was set up in a particular way. Um, different companies have very different approaches to their graduate schemes, um, but all of them will be built up around making sure that you have the skills and the experience to do your job really well. Um, of course, you don't have to go and go to a graduate scheme. Uh, lots of companies don't offer them, 
and that's completely fine. You can just go into a job, but also you can go it alone. You don't have to be employed at all. You can start your own company and be an entrepreneur um, and, and go it alone, um, which many engineers do. And then just to mention on the charge shipper and engineering institution side, there are benefits of becoming part of a, an institution like the IET um, because it gives you access to this wider community of engineers. And it also means that you have a route um, for chartership. And the IT isn't the only uh, institution. There are lots of different um, engineering institutions um, that are particularly focused on, on different engineering disciplines. And then, of course, you don't have to become a member of an institution at all. That's, that's entirely optional. So, yeah, hopefully I've given the impression that um, there are lots of different ways to become an engineer. Um, engineering is a really um, broad field, but really engineering is about using um, science and technology and math skills to solve problems and design solutions and make the world a better place, uh, which I think is a really important and satisfying job to do. Um, yes, and I'd highly recommend it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Olivia. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, we have Olivia now for a 50 minute Q&A. Um, as a fun game, if you want to play, you can try and work out which bits are pre-recorded and which bits are live. Um, but I think the best thing we can do now is probably go straight into the questions. Um, I'm really impressed. We've been getting loads and loads of questions. Everyone's been upvoting. Um, just as a reminder, go to Slido with the hashtag green energy and you can ask your questions. Um, I'll start with a nice light one, Olivia. Um, is green energy, and we, we spoke a bit in your presentation about society, is, is green energy a luxury only first world uh, countries can afford? Yeah, that's a good one. Um, so, uh, I mean, the first answer is no. And there are some um, developing countries who have been using green energy for, for a very long time. Um, some of them are very hydro based. Uh, many of the biggest oil exporters actually themselves are, are powered on, on hydro. Um, but uh, beyond that, uh, really green energy is increasingly being seen as is an um, important opportunity for investment, um, no matter where it is, but, but in developing countries. Some of my projects look at this opportunity so that countries that currently rely on uh, fossil fuels as part of their income, um, it, uh, the decarbonisation and green energy means that we can create jobs um, and make sure we provide electricity to, um, to the population um, and take uh, um, fossil fuels out of the, uh, out of the equation. So, so yeah, I think it's something that, that's definitely uh, an opportunity for everyone. Um, just to say that's a question from Jonathan, so thank you, Jonathan. Um, I am going to go for a bit of a themed question and pull a couple in. We had a question from Ralph. Um, do you think nuclear energy uh, should play a part in the decarbonisation process, um, particularly considering environmentalist opposition to it? And we were also asked a question, if I can find it, by Catherine talking about shipping. Um, is nuclear power not more sensible on ships and submarines? Hmm. It's a, about nuclear power. <laughs> it's a good question. And um, yeah, nuclear can be uh, quite divisive, um, partly for the safety thing and partly because of the, the cost. Um, it is, uh, to me, it's really important to not take it off the table as an option uh, because uh, there is limited resource, particularly in the UK. We've not got a whole lot of land to put wind turbines on, etc. Um, and whilst we can get quite a long way with uh, with intermittent renewable generation, actually having nuclear um, to back all that up could be a, a really important part of the energy mix. Um, but uh, there's always the questions around the practicalities and the economics, as, as I've mentioned in my, in my talk. Um, and thinking, I suppose, longer term when, when you're trying to do a transition with nuclear, um, there's a really interesting question here uh, that we've got, unfortunately from Anonymous, um, but it's about electric vehicles. And, and since we're planning to do that switch and uh, that transition to electric vehicles, 
Um, how can we overcome or, or, or other things being done to address the problems around lithium and, and cobalt and the manufacture of electric vehicles? Because on the surface, it seems like a green technology, mm. but clearly um, there are aspects of it where we may end up in a similar situation as now with fossil fuels. Yeah, so it, it's another huge question. And, and I think there is a danger that we are heading into um, uh, more issues with some of our green solutions. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think more needs to be done. Part of what can be done, of course, is really careful recycling um, and careful management of, of these uh, materials once, they're, once they've finished their first life, um, because the more we can do to reuse, the better. Um, and, uh, and also uh, just development of other technologies that don't rely on, on, these, um, uh, on these materials. Um, yeah, and, and yeah, hopefully those are, are in development, um, but they haven't, uh, they're not, uh, they're not quite there yet. Well, we hope, we hope they'll be coming. Um, I've worked with you for a while now, so I know your love of the energy system. So I'll throw you an energy systems question from ION. Um, do you think large scale energy storage to balance out the dips in supply is actually feasible on a countrywide scale? Um, and I'm going to add in as well, are there other elements about um, renewable power and, and balancing out the dips that we need to consider? Yeah, the um, how intermittent renewable generation is, is um, really is one of the biggest challenges um, because we can't control when the sun shines, um, which is very frustrating um, <laughs> for lots of reasons. Uh, but uh, um, yeah, so storage definitely can help. And the kinds of storage that we currently have um, are already helping. Um, day by day. So uh, we have uh, large pumped hydro storage that has been in operation for decades and has been supporting the grid for decades. Um, so, so we're already using it, I guess is one, one um, answer. Uh, but the kinds of scale we need for um, balancing the day and the night and balancing summer and winter is, is far beyond that. I think certainly day by day, one of the big things that can help is electric vehicles. So some of us in, in the power sector think of electric vehicles partly as ways to get around and partly as batteries on wheels. And if we can use electric vehicles and the batteries in electric vehicles, which are parked most of the time on a country scale to charge when there's lots of wind generation and not charge or even maybe discharge and support the grid when there isn't any wind, um, then that can really help. Um, but it certainly isn't the whole of the solution. Um, there's real questions around what we call seasonal um, storage. So in the summer where we're generating lots of solar power, how can we store that in a really reliable way to help us in the winter? And that's a question that lots of people are thinking about, but is really unanswered at the moment. Um, and clearly people are thinking about it. And we, if we talk about storage, I'll segue very nicely into another question, almost too well planned that Ralph asked. Um, do you think that the development of carbon capture with storage, because this is looking a little bit more offshore, a little bit more at the, the, the ways of keeping the fossil fuels, do you think that might disincentivize companies from actually producing less carbon in the first place and is a bit of a workaround for mm. fossil fuel companies? Yeah, I think carbon capture and storage is hugely important uh, because really, if we're going to get to net zero, um, there are some things, there are some uh, releasing, there's some emissions that are just not going to be able to uh, be completely mitigated. And those really, really hard to reach areas, carbon capture and storage should be used for those. Um, it is, I think, it is currently extremely expensive and not developed. Um, I don't think it's ever going to be, be a really cheap option. Um, so that's, that's kind of one side of it um, that might stop it, it being a, a kind of easy fix. Um, which slightly reassures me. Um, there is, however, to me, a real danger that um, it is keeping the fossil fuel uh, sector alive, uh, because if fossil fuels can continue to be used um, and, and then carbon is, is captured, that's not, uh, that's not helping those hard to reach areas. And that's not helping us get to, to a carbon negative, which is really where we need to get even beyond carbon zero. Um, that is simply making up for us having a, um, an, easy, um, an easy fix for, for fossil fuel energy. Um, so, so yeah, my hope is the answer is no. Um, and I don't think we should be doing it I, because I think carbon capture is really important for 
the really hard to reach um, carbon and for uh, and for getting to carbon negative and to try and reverse some of the damage that's been being done. Thank I apologize. My, my eyes are going here because there are questions and questions and questions and questions coming through. So this is absolutely brilliant. I will do my best to try and answer the ones that are, that are upvoted, but I would recommend everyone keep upvoting because it makes my life easier. Um, <laughs> I would like to ask you now, bearing in mind again, we've known each other for a while and um, sitting on some of the panels that we do, we tend to be the youngest in the room. Um, what is it that young engineers, because we've been asked by Nabila, how can young engineers like ourselves try to lobby the government? I, I want to shift that slightly from lobby, but how is it that engineers over some other young, young, uh, young people can, can make a difference and, and how can they help to introduce changes that will hit, hit net zero? Or what have you done from your personal experience? Yeah, it's, um, it's a good question and it's a hard one to answer, um, but there is loads that we can do. I think one of the main things that um, actually anyone in general should be doing is, is talking about it um, and talking about how important it is, telling everyone what you're doing um, to reduce carbon in your own life, telling your, um, your uh, um, government representatives, your MPs, how much it matters to you and how much it really does influence who you vote for. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, telling the people that you buy stuff from how much it matters to you and how you will stop buying from them if they don't behave better. Um, I think that's a really big thing that everyone can do. Um, from the engineering point of view, um, lots of what I do in some of my volunteer work and, and in my job as well is try and um, try and make sure that what we're saying um, is correct and balanced. I think there's a real balance between being persuasive which is very important, but not um, exaggerating and and being you know untruthful. Um, so I think there's a real need to make sure that um, we are we do we strike that balance. So we don't want to overcomplicate things. Engineers like to be uh, very <laughs> very overcomplicated with how we explain things, but um, but still make sure that what we're saying is true and um, and based in fact. Uh, and not to over exaggerate to to make the point because the issue is the moment we do that is um, so if someone manages to tear down that argument which they will if, if it's not true um, it undermines the whole thing so so I think from an engineer's point of view if we can make sure that's that's uh, yeah if we base what we're saying in fact I think that bastions of truth and knowledge I like that absolutely um right how long do we have I think we have about five minutes before we go to uh, a 10 minute break. Thank you. I've just seen a five minute thing come up. Um, so I'm going to ask uh, two more. I'll try and do two more questions. Um, well, a very, very difficult question from Ridula. Um, which industry do you think requires the most urgent change to decarbonized processes and why? Bit of a bit of a difficult question to put you on the spot. But if you had to pick, yeah. I know, again, that you work in the energy sector and the electricity sector and there have been very mm. big um, steps made in that sector. Is there any that you look at and you say, mm, you might need to pick up the pace a bit here? Yeah, so the, the energy sector, um, there's a reason where the energy sector is is um, making the most change. And, and one is that it's um, by far one of the biggest emitters. And the other is that actually the solutions are um, quite well developed, um, not completely there yet. And we've still got a lot of work to do, but, um, but it's, there are solutions in place that means we can reduce and reduce um, in, in energy, which is fantastic. There are some harder to reach areas. Um, so I mentioned, um, you know, shipping and aviation and, and industry. Um, I do think that uh, building and manufacture is, it's so important to have a real look at those sectors because the embedded carbon in the things that we make and buy um, it quite often by far the, the, the biggest portion of their uh, carbon. So, so if we can find um, lower carbon materials, if we can be much better at reusing and recycling and um, creating materials that can be recycled well and efficiently, um, because many materials, even though they are recycled, it takes a lot of energy and a lot of chemicals. And um, so if we, if we could be much better at um, looking at a real circular economy, 
which is what it's what it's called when you're making sure that you will really keep an eye on um, anything that is waste actually has uses so that you, all of the material is going around circularly. Um, so yeah, I think making stuff, manufacturing and building. Um, yeah, if we can stop using cement, that would be fantastic. Almost a perfect segue into one of our latest speakers, John, who's from Energy Sprong UK and is going to be talking about um, innovative ways of building. So thank, thank you for doing my job for me. Um, I think we've got, um, well, we've got about three minutes. I was going to save that top question. Unfortunately, um, for those of you who've asked questions for Chris, Chris Stark um, gave the keynote and unfortunately won't be able to, to answer any Q&A questions. Um, but I will ask um, one quick question. We talked about air travel. Um, again, Ralph, what do you think is the best solution to achieve zero carbon air travel, given that, as you said in the presentation, battery technology doesn't seem viable at the moment? Mm. Tough one, but... Yeah, yeah, it is a tough one. And actually, I said uh, battery travel, uh, battery is not viable for, for long haul. I think short haul, battery is probably the answer um, to me. Uh, certainly within... within um, uh, country, although to a certain extent we should probably just get a train, but that's a slightly different argument. <laughs> um, uh, but yes, so maybe within within kind of nor northern Europe from from here, um, batteries could be really viable. Um, longer than that, uh, we could think about ammonia. We could think about biofuels, um, but there's real questions around making sure you source those in a really um, uh, a careful way to make sure that. It really is zero carbon, and you're also not chopping down rainforest to to grow um, to grow whatever you're um, whatever you're using. Um, uh, we could think about uh, green hydrogen, and then so that is hydrogen that's generated by electrolyzing water using um, using green uh, energy, um, and then turning that into ammonia or or potentially uh, something like methanol. Um, of course, if you're turning it into methanol, you have to be careful where you're getting that carbon from, um, which could be carbon capture, actually. <laughs> um. Yeah, brilliant. Um, and actually, that's interesting because we've had, um, I think France have announced recently or today that they're looking at potentially uh, banning short haul flights under two and a half hours and, and yes. just, as you say, move to train. We've got one more minute. I will ask the difficult question that the biller asked and that everyone has top voted, um, which was for Chris, but um, leaving us on a, keeping it light, keeping it positive. Um, <laughs> do, you, do you think, Olivia, that we are on track to meet the net zero target in the UK at 2050? I think we've got a long way to go, um, but that's okay because we haven't been going at it for very long. Um, I think a lot of what we need, we have in place. I think we have the skills, I think we have um, the, the kind of will in the most part. Um, I think we have the, lots of the technology we already know about um, and there's some exciting new developments that we need to make, but it, it feels very doable. Um, we just need to make sure we do it and make sure that um, we, uh, we encourage governments and companies um, and all the big decision makers that this is so important to us that it will affect who we vote for and what we buy and all those important things. So, so that's the influence that we can have, I think. Wonderful. Well, we've hit the time. Thank you very much, Olivia. It's been an absolute pleasure, as always, hanging out with you. Um, we've now got a 10 minute break. Um, so join us then after and you will see a pre-recorded bit of me and then I'll be back later live. So thank you again, Olivia, and enjoy your break. Will do, thank you for your questions. <laughs> Cheers.
Welcome back. Uh, I hope you had a good break. Uh, I'm really pleased to introduce now John Warren from Energy Sprong to talk about the built environment and climate change. Hi, I'm John Warren. I'm an engineer and I've always been fascinated in the, uh, our energy system, how we balance electricity uh, second by second, how we use power to, to keep our industry going and keep ourselves warm in our homes. It's changing really quickly out there now uh, and this change is fascinate, fascinating me. I've been pri privileged to have a number of roles across the energy system uh, and in the industry around that over the last uh, few years. Uh, and I'd like to share some of my first-hand experience with you um, in terms of how, it, how the system might change and grow, how we can introduce innovation uh, to help us speed up our response to climate change and what this could mean for you uh, in, a, in a career in engineering. So you've probably seen slides like this before that show the global emissions that have crept up and up and up as we've been more effective uh, at delivering energy to our homes, businesses, and emissions have gone up with it. This has brought uh, with it lots of positive changes in people's lives, warmer homes, uh, more productive uh, business, um, and more comfort and wealth. Um, but we need to make a radical change to that system and, and decarbonize and move away from that uh, trajectory. Uh, and on the right there, you can see some of the, the ambitious um, uh, lines we need to follow in order to, to hit our climate change goals. Bringing that uh, objective of getting to net zero is uh, really important and bringing that suit as soon as we can uh, will avoid dangerous and compromise our ability to to grow uh, and enjoy uh, the productivity and benefits that um, currently we, um, we we experience on planet earth of course um, your career so, uh, sooner than you know it will be out into this world where lots of change is going to be happening and we need to really uh, Get, get moving with technology deployment, so bringing in low carbon technologies uh, and um, making sure we're innovating and bringing that um, um, uh, decline in emissions um, to be as soon as possible. This next chart looks at um, the energy flows in the UK and you can see uh, on the left there we have about 230 million tonnes of oil equivalent coming into the country. Uh, and using um, uh, in, in industry our primary demand uh, and in our houses and in transport only 150 out. If we just zoom in a little bit we can, um, I've just taken off the exported emissions on the bottom but we can see that um, fossil fuels account um, for quite a significant amount of the balance so if we start to take those out and get rid of the gas at the top we take out some of the coal emission uh, um, uh, uh, supply and delivery and we take out some of the petroleum as well we're, we're left with very little uh, uh, of what we need today so uh, uh, we really need to expand that a, a great deal and you can see some of the things in there in that mix uh, particularly renewable energy and nuclear energy uh, have the potential to enable us to get more power into the system that we need on the right hand side of that we've also got uh, we've got the the outputs and where the energy flows to so we've got industry taking up um, a significant proportion of the energy uh, a huge amount of energy going into our transport systems and our cars uh, energy going into our homes as well as the commercial sector and all of those will have to change as well because um, the amount of fossil energy going uh, directly into industry is it, pretty much about two-thirds of that at the moment it's even greater for transport, over 90% comes from petroleum products. Uh, and then in our homes as well, uh, we are absolutely hooked on gas at the moment um, with, a, with a lot of power coming from gas. So we really need to drive efficiency and, and enable ourselves to move away from some of those energy sources. Of course, the, uh, the, the system itself isn't 100% uh, uh, isn't efficient. There's quite a lot of uh, inefficiencies in that. Um, so as we move forward, we've got to think about what smart technology, can we store energy, can we make the whole system efficient as well? Uh, so that's a, another um, area of focus. This is a website I often check in on. Um, we are making great progress on, uh, in some of the technologies and, and over the last few years we've seen loads of solar added to the system, loads of um, 
and wind power as well. And on particularly windy days or sunny days or cold days, it's really um, interesting to go onto this website and just have a look at uh, what the demand levels are uh, and how much uh, electricity solar is on the, on the system and how much gas we're still using in order to keep the lights on and power the country. So let's have a, a closer look at technology deployment and what we need to do uh, next in terms of um, uh, moving towards uh, a, a lower carbon energy s system, future energy system. Low carbon generation is, is absolutely key as we touched on before. So boosting those technologies, whether it's nuclear power uh, or uh, wind, solar, some of those renewable technologies. Efficiency, also super important. Uh, we started with the power sector, but, but now we're starting to move, uh, move into other sectors such as our homes and industry and see what we can do to reduce that final demand. Nuclear, um, uh, I'm going to touch on again, uh, is uh, potentially a, a, an interesting source of power and some different options emerging about how uh, the way we deploy nuclear power. Uh, transportation, um, uh, we're already seeing that the, the race to EVs begin um, and, and major manufacturers move towards that and the infrastructure start to uh, be built to support that uh, new uh, energy vector in, in transportation. But there's a lot of heavy duty vehicles out there that still uh, need innovation uh, and development before they can be uh, decarbonized and support our, our, our move towards those uh, climate goals. Going down at the bottom there, we've got carbon uh, removal. Removal. I'm not going to talk a lot about that today, but um, uh, a lot of exciting stuff going in, in, in potentially how we can store, remove um, uh, carbon emissions from the atmosphere or connect uh, power, conventional power stations up so that we can take some of the CO2 out of the atmosphere before it's a problem and store that uh, underground. Uh, a hugely exciting area. Uh, next one is, is hydrogen. Uh, again, the role of hydrogen. Uh, it's a great uh, gas for storing energy and uh, empowering industry, but um, we're still working out, I think, uh, as a country as to where that power will be will be used best and most efficiently and uh, what the real role for hydrogen will be. Energy storage, really important. Again, as we have variable renewables that um, uh, come on and off with the weather, uh, how can we store some of that energy? How can we um, uh, keep assets running uh, overnight and store some of that power so that we can use it when we need it? Uh, the role of energy storage and all the different types of en energy storage, again, a really exciting area. Finally, adaptation. Hopefully, um, uh, we, we hit our climate goals sooner rather than later. We, re we won't need too much adaptation, but it's a, a really important area uh, in, in terms of making sure our, our infrastructure is resilient uh, and we're, we're not overheating in our homes uh, and what adaptations we need to do in order to um, um, uh, su survive and enjoy life in, in a slightly warmer world. Next slide is um, about low carbon generation. Uh, on the left there is a, is, a, is a project I was involved in a few years ago to build a, a 100 meter wind turbine blade um, using uh, component pieces uh, and, and carbon fiber technologies. Um, but it's not always about the blades and the turbines um, uh, that, that have helped wind power. There's lots of other innovation that, that fits around in that industry uh, where great progress has been made. So um, uh, DC cabling out, out to uh, offshore wind um, uh, turbines, really important how that all links together and brings the power back into the country. Um, uh, uh, subsea systems and, uh, and foundation systems for wind turbines also really important and um, uh, will be critical uh, to as we expand that power source uh, and build out. Uh, and all of that has delivered what we see on the on the right there, which has been uh, quite a dramatic reduction in the cost of wind power. So it's now a, a really credible source of power, quite a, a reliable source of power uh, and a cost effective source of power. A quick look at nuclear. Um, again, um, a lot of the nuclear stations we have in the UK are due to um, uh, 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 due to finish production in uh, by 2025, so not not long away. We've got one nuclear station uh, currently on, uh, being built. Really huge construction project. Um, um, uh, lots of people say we, we we may need more nuclear power, and the decisions around that will be um, 
um, uh, will be forthcoming over the next few years. So really exciting to see uh, what, what could happen next. Um, another alternative up at the top there is uh, a small modular reactor, uh, which is being um, uh, designed and trialed by Rolls-Royce uh, with a, uh, using some of their existing technology in that area. And the cost projections of that are, are also quite competitive. So is a, is a better strategy for nuclear to have more smaller distributed stations than uh, lots of larger big ones. Um, cert certainly we'll see that play out uh, as the uh, technology evolves in the next few years. And at the bottom right there is, um, is where I started my career uh, at Sellafield in, in, in West Cumbria. Uh, equally interesting, it's actually where, well, the nuclear decommissioning uh, uh, industry actually takes up half of, of the UK's energy budget at the moment but still um, uh, a lot of technology going into that space in terms of um, uh, cleaning up some of the legacy stuff uh, uh, over the last 50 years. Next one, uh, an area where I've spent quite a lot of time over the last uh, 10 or 20 years is industrial efficiency. So looking at how we can uh, carry on with our um, uh, important industrial processes, but make these more efficient, whether that's monitoring energy um, and seeing where we can reduce it um, or, or switching away from uh, fossil fuels to more uh, efficient vectors uh, for, for energy. So can we electrify some of the industry or can we use hydrogen? And in fact, there on the right is um, uh, an electrolyzer plant that, that uses excess wind and renewable power to create hydrogen gas, which can then be used for storage um, or, or to power uh, industrial sources. So next bit of my presentation, um, uh, I wanted to introduce the valley of death. Uh, this is an important uh, uh, concept in, in innovation. And you can see there we're tracking the, the development of innovative products from, from left to right. And this is pretty much where um, the journey that all products will take uh, as they come out of labs from basic uh, principles and, and early concepts through field trials through testing things in the real world, uh, through ramping up production uh, and securing that market update that makes them um, uh, commercially viable um, through to operations. And this is a really good structure if you're thinking um, about where you might want to spend your time, um, what sort of skills uh, and what sort of outlook have you got? Are, are you really fascinated with that technical uh, lab work and the, the, the first principles and concepts? Do you like to get out in the field and try new things uh, in the middle there um, and, and test uh, new systems in operational environments? Uh, they might not always work, um, but um, are, are you ready to learn and improve those through to uh, production and manufacturing skills? How do you scale up? How do you make, uh, build things, produce things cost effectively? How do you create those initial markets? And then finally on the right there, operations. Um, do you, do you, are you, do you like um, um, uh, things that work or uh, big scale things that um, uh, you need to deploy in more, uh, we, we need to deploy in more quantity or improve the efficiency um, or scale up? Um, is that where you want to spend your time? So this is a really, uh, I, I thought this might be a really uh, useful um, uh, uh, a kind of guide to the different areas where you might uh, end up with, a, with an engineering career. Uh, and certainly uh, researching more about technology readiness levels and, uh, and innovation in the, the valley of death will give you that um, uh, a sense of, um, uh, of all the different potential roles. The final bit of my presentation, I wanted to look at um, um, domestic retrofit in, in a bit more detail. So that's a huge, another hugely, really important area of, of uh, decarbonizing. 30% of emissions come from our homes um, if we look across Europe, the map here, I'm actually involved with an initiative called Energiesprong, which is a Dutch initiative that looks at um, uh, um, retrofitting homes to a, to a net zero standard. Uh, and uh, we're working with five other countries. Uh, and if we look at, at across these five countries, there's 100 million homes, all of which will need a, a deep retrofit if we're to get along uh, and achieve our, our climate objectives. And, that, and that's a build rate of 20,000 per day. Um, so that's really challenging. And, and we don't think that we can do that with the technologies we have today. We've got to innovate and develop new, new products. 
this next slide, uh, you can see some of some of the ways we do retrofit today don't always work. We often leak quite a lot of heat where uh, they involve a lot of on site time. Uh, everything's done differently house to house. So what we're trying to do at Energy Sprong is really industrialize that. Uh, and this next video sets out um, our aims and what we're trying to do around that. Worldwide, we use and waste a lot of energy, much of which is used in our homes. At the same time, we pay high energy bills in order to live in houses that are actually often uncomfortable because of humidity, mould and draughts. What can we do about this? The Dutch initiative Energy Sprong has come up with an idea. The team at Energy Sprong have developed a method to transform existing houses into net zero energy houses. Net zero energy means that the house generates as much energy as it needs for heating, hot water, lights and household appliances, resulting in a warm and comfortable home. This is made possible by the use of new technologies such as prefabricated facades, new smart heating and cooling installations and insulated rooftops equipped with solar panels. People don't even have to leave their homes because the transformation is completed within one week. After a net zero energy makeover, the house looks bright and modern from the outside and no longer has moisture or drafts inside. This makeover comes with a 30-year warranty on both the energy and indoor climate performance. This all sounds great, but who's going to pay for it? The principle is, the money that you'd normally spend on your energy bills, combined with reduced repairs and maintenance costs, pays for the renovation. So you get a makeover for your house without any additional costs. Hundreds of people in the Netherlands already enjoy more comfortable living conditions following their successful net zero energy makeovers. And new makeovers are taking place every day To learn more, go to energiesprong.eu. So you'll see the, the concepts in there are um, use a number of different approaches um, uh, to make uh, the, the domestic and, and industrialized net zero retrofit work. Uh, on the top left here, we're starting to see industrialization of the production of those um, uh, retrofit solutions. So the wrap thing, uh, wrap has been built by a a, a robot in a factory on the top left there. Uh, in, in the bottom left, um, we're putting all the components uh, together again in a factory um, in, a, in a product where you've got a, a heat pump uh, and a battery and a control system, hot water tank and a ventilator, ventilation system, all in one box that can be uh, craned onto the home uh, once it's complete. In the top right, we're changing the way um, consumers interact with their homes. So moving away from a confusing uh, energy bill situation, an energy and gas bill, getting rid of gas all uh, completely and moving to more like a mobile phone bundle um, where, where a consumer gets uh, a guarantee of heat, uh, a set amount of hot water each day, an allowance of, for plug load and, and a promise that their home is going to be uh, warm, comfortable uh, and free from damp over a long term. So we're using that kind of mobile phone, phone bundle approach um, to sell a, a, a full uh, comfort package to, uh, to occupants that live in these homes. Uh, and down in the, in the right hand corner there, you can see our first project in the UK, which was uh, essentially a, 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 an early pilot of some of the technologies that we wanted to use. And we've carefully monitored those um, uh, and, and checked their performance. Uh, and we're now looking to scale that up uh, and um, secure the factory production capacity to start to do this at scale in the UK. So that brings my talk to an end. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, there's loads of opportunities uh, of what's going, um, uh, going on in the energy sector and the future energy system. It's going to be over to you soon to get involved in that uh, and um, really find a, a productive and enjoyable career over that uh, within that space. Um, uh, and I think it's over to you next for the Q&A uh, and I look forward to answering your questions.
Hello, uh, I'm back live again with you. Um, thank you, John. Excellent presentation. Um, and thank you, everyone. The questions are keeping coming through. Uh, we've archived off the questions from the last session, so we've got fresh new ones. So please go on Slido uh, with the hashtag Green Energy to ask your questions. And of course, upvote the ones that you like um, a lot. We're going to start then with uh, a question from Thomas, which has been upvoted uh, massively uh, from a green energy perspective. And I wonder if we can sort of touch on, on the little bit that you talked about, John, around the valley of death and the innovation aspect. Um, but from a green energy perspective, um, what's your view on Hyperloop and I suppose other options and new technologies for, to address some of the problems, um, particularly as it seems to make a vast change to the transportation sector. So a, a bit about Hyperloop perhaps as one of a series of new innovative uh, technologies. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I mean, there's some really challenging stuff going on in, in, in transportation, um, particularly around, um, uh, you know, what we do about aviation. Can we really create enough biofuel and, 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 keep the status quo flying, um, so to speak. Uh, and, you know, that's looking really, really hard. Um, and then we're seeing great progress with uh, long, uh, long distance uh, train, train travel as well. And, uh, you know, electrification, electrification of that is, is just a no brainer. So um, uh, yeah, there's some, there's some real challenges and opportunities there. I'm, uh, yeah, Hyperloop's really, really interesting as well, but you, you've got to look at um, the kind of, uh, the market model around that and, and the costs around over oh, some of the capital costs. Um, but I, I think it's really captured the um, consumer's interest, hasn't it, in terms of, wow, I, you know, I could get from A to B so quickly and without traffic and in this really smooth and, and cool way. And, and we're going to absolutely need some of that consumer orientated thinking in there. I, I, I think we should just keep an eye on that one and, and see where it goes in terms of um, you know, how, what the adoption model is, where it starts, can we link up a few cities, you know, is it going to be um, um, uh, just a small programme in one country or is this going to take over the world? In, really interesting to watch, but uh, hopefully it can uh, help to bring some of the thinking and interest into solving the uh, kind of decarbonisation of transport challenge, I suppose. Perfect. Um, thank you, Thomas. Uh, the next question we've got is from an anonymous. They've asked a lot of questions. Please do put your names on though, because some of these questions are phenomenal. So do, do put your names on, own them. Um, bit of a, an interesting one when you think about retrofit. Um, should we prioritize uh, reducing our energy requirement or should we be increasing the green energy supply? Bit of a kind of chicken and egg choice, choice one there. Uh, I don't think it's a choice at all. I think we have to, you know, you've seen what we need to achieve. Uh, we have to do both in a completely <laughs> phenomenal way. So we, we just, yeah, we need to do both. And, you know, I, I'm on the, on the retrofit side at the moment um, and reducing energy uh, and increasing energy efficiency, which is something that we've struggled with for, for years and years. So, um, you know, I, I'd say we've got to do loads of that and in a different and in a, in a new way and a, a game-changing way um, but and lots of people say well let's just decarbonize the energy sector and then people can carry on living in their homes as they do and using loads of energy and it all leaking out uh, everywhere but if you look at the economics I think energy efficiency is really undersold in terms of uh, taking out some of the capital costs and easing some of the challenges you know so if you've got an energy efficiency uh, energy efficient home you can heat it, uh, some of our houses now, you can heat on a Tuesday and they're still warm on a, on a Thursday. So, you know, by being super energy efficient, we can bring a lot of um, complementary um, uh, attributes that can help the rest of the, the smart energy system decarbonize. So, um, yeah, I think we've got to do both. Yeah, I thought that might be the, question, the, the answer to that one. <laughs> um, that actually segues very nicely um, into a question from, uh, from Ralph. And I suppose it sort of brings the Hyperloop question and it kind of brings in this, this sort of follow-up question that we had, which is, um, do you think there are any areas where technology can't provide a complete solution and it's up to people's behavior changing um, and, and it really comes down to, yeah, like, I, I imagine for, for you working in retrofit where you are having quite a big impact on people's lives and go, I suppose going into their homes, um, yeah, where, where are the kind of areas that you see where it's it's really up to people to change? Yeah, I, I, I think 
the kind of, um, I don't know, that I, I think we should perhaps reframe it as where can we make the technology encourage people's behaviour? Um, I, I just, I, yeah, I, I spent a lot of time trying to convince people to switch off lights and uh, spot, um, uh, you know, energy savings, but, you know, can't, can't technology do that with, with, with a bit of a, a bit of a nudge every now and again, or with a, with a really uh, pleasant experience for consumers, or, you, you know, that really, um, that, that, that really encourages people to change the, the, the way they have to behave to adopt some of these uh, new technologies. So, you know, with EVs, can we make, can we make the charging infrastructure like a, a really pleasant experience where people are quite happy to stop off or integrate charging with with things that they want to do, like going to the shops or the cinema or uh, stopping for lunch or, or, or whatever else. So, and the same in people's homes. Um, do do we need people to really micromanage every room in their house with the temperature and that sort of thing? Or is AI going to solve that in terms of monitoring where people are and um, how happy they are and, uh, and, and everything else. So we're, we're starting to see some of that creep in. So people don't even need a, a thermostat as such or temperature controls in every room now. Um, you know, the house manages it itself and, and, and consumers can just get on with their lives. So you're sort of saying that it's important that technology has a, has a role to make things and, and behavior as easy as possible for, for consumers to change. Yeah. I, Absolutely. Uh, and uh, yeah, I just, uh, I think what we want from consumers is, um, you know, this positivity about uh, moving towards a net zero situation, you know, that the, the future isn't going to be costly or cold. Um, it's just, um, we need, we need some of those uh, first movers to get on the, get on the bus and start, you know, um, you know, uh, talking to their friends about moving to a a new low carbon house that's been a, a really positive experience. So that's what to start doing. shouting about the technology and the, the solution. Yeah. Great. Um, really, really nice question as well. Again, from Thomas, I think, unless it's a different Thomas, we don't know. Um, by 2024, all cars manufactured are to be hybrid or electric. So there are quite clear um, electric vehicles targets that the government have put in 2030. Nothing sold has, um, it's, all, it's all up to nothing other than a hybrid. 2035, everything has to have a plug. Are there targets like this that the UK government has set with um, with homes and green energy? And I suppose, as, as, as I know, the difference between homes that are being built and homes that already exist? Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the government is has toyed with some targets around <laughs> uh, 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 green, green homes. <clears throat> uh, and there are some inklings of uh, policy change around um, uh, new build homes. New build homes are, are, are significantly easier than because um, you can build in the green technology from the start. Um, uh, so you don't have people that have existing gas connections and like the gas cookers and they're you know they're they're super hot heating and that sort of thing. So um, there there are uh, emerging targets for for new build. With with retrofit, it's it's really under ambitious. Uh, we think you know people have got to save. People have got to get to an EPC uh, band C by 2030 or, or 2035 even, and and we think that's that's setting the wrong message for um, for the industry really because um, we really need people to get to net zero by 2050. And so if, if we want to, if, if if you know we move 20% of people to net zero by 2030, that would be a kind of better path for for, for transition. So we think the government's being a bit under ambitious. Um, we, we can understand some of the challenges, some of the industry doesn't want to change, you know, it's like turning around the oil tanker. Um, uh, there, aren't, there aren't a lot of clear solutions for all, houses, all house types, so, you know, you can understand some nerves from government about moving towards, um, you know, saying that everyone's got to live in a, a net zero home by 2040 when we don't know what the solutions are yet, so... Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, we've had a, a very good question from this uh, magical anonymous person again. Um, again, please do put your names on because they are brilliant questions, and I'd like to give you the credit. Um, many houses in the UK are Victorian, and I, I know that I'm in one right now. Um, do you think the quick retrofits that you spoke about in your presentation are viable in these homes um, as opposed to more modern standard houses? And and how do you sort of see um, that sort of old housing stock issue being addressed? Not an easy question, I know. <laughs> yeah, well, hello from another Victorian uh, house in the UK, and there's, there are a lot of them about. Um, 
but yeah, there, there certainly are some solutions that get some of the way in Victorian houses. Um, so um, adopting those technologies as a transition towards 2050 is, is, is never a bad thing. But, you know, we're really focused on quite square, boxy, sometimes ugly looking houses with our with our quick fit energy sprung solution. So, um, but what we're trying to do there is just create a market around starting to move the market towards really high performance solutions. And what we're seeing is bits um, drop off almost uh, what we're proposing. So industrialized heat pumps and PV battery systems that could be adapted for a Victorian house. We're seeing new technologies and in installation systems. So, you know, uh, an installation uh, an installation system doesn't have to be an external wrap that you know brings a completely new look to the house. Can we do things with 3D printing? Uh, can we do things with new materials um, that really um, do provide an acceptable solution for, for those who want to preserve the kind of Victorian or Georgian look of, of people's houses? So we're hoping that's that's kind of coming next or coming soon. Brilliant. Um... Rania, I've seen your question. Um, I have a, uh, the next speaker would be a really good person to keep that question to. So we'll, we'll put that on there. Um, Jessica's asked, um, uh, Jessica's actually asked two questions that have come up. What the first one is about being able to do the transformations to offices in public buildings, as well as houses. And then a, a second one, we've talked about um, the developing world a little bit already, but do you think we'll be able to build zero carbon homes in the first place? Or do you think we're going to be in a position where 10 years, 15 years down the line, we'll be doing the same kind of retrofit project? The kind of two questions in, in one there slightly. <laughs> yeah. So I've done, I've done quite a bit of work in offices in industrial buildings, and it is a very specialist one by one. Um, uh, you, you know, every project's very different and there's unique needs. And heavy industry is particularly challenging. Offices are a little bit less flexible, but I, the targets are a, a bit more stringent there and people are moving towards, uh, you, you know, people, you can see that people are preferring when they, when they start a new lease for an office building, if it's low energy or low carbon, you know, that, has, that starts starting to have appeal now. So, um, uh, you know, things are changing there. So I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful. Um, on the zero carbon homes, you know, let's start at home. Uh, you know, we're not a developing country. We could afford to do this. The technologies are all there to build absolutely zero carbon homes today. There should be no dispute about that. We should be doing it here. And yeah, in developing countries as well, um, sometimes where there are rapidly growing populations, uh, why not do that there too? And I think we, we are seeing countries adopt that um, uh, fr from the start. And some people doing it faster than us, which is which is an embarrassment, um, I, I think. Um, and yeah, of course, developing countries as well, um, different sorts of houses, different sorts of climates. Um, so th th there's, but the solutions there uh, as, as much as there are available here, I'd say. Yeah, sort of fit the need of the country that you're in, I suppose, because yep. different climate. Yeah, very, very good. Okay, um, we have two more minutes of, of questions. I think, um, well, I will ask you the, the, the question that I finished on with Olivia and the one that was posed to Chris, but um, I was answering from with your knowledge of the housing uh, and, and the retrofit market. Um, bearing in mind the 2050 targets, do you, John Warren, think that we're on target to meet these net zero 2050 targets? Again, difficult question. <laughs> I, I, I can't, I think it's my first slide or my second slide. You know, it's an incredible turnaround that we've got to, uh, we, we, we've got to do in, in a very short amount of time and you know we are not on course at the moment and, and this is why we need to deploy and we need to innovate much faster uh, than, than we're doing today so you know we are not on target for that and if you'd asked me two years ago I'd say the situation was looking pretty hopeless but what we've seen just in the last couple of years is you know um, global voices for net zero uh, and a real, um, uh, even though people don't know what the plan is or what the, what the solutions are at the moment, people saying in, in government, uh, national government, local government, that we really need to make a, a change and we, we committed to that 2050 um, uh, result that we need. And we'll see a lot of that coming out and being discussed at COP26. 
Um, so I, I think there is hope. There is hope. We can oh, see. That's good. <laughs> there is hope. Yeah, uh, we can see the innovation rate increasing. The budgets and the techno the budgets going forward now to develop the technology we need uh, are not quite there, but they're they're moving in the right direction. So uh, you know we can do this if we get on top of that innovation and um, we start deploying the technologies we need. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much, John. It's been an absolute pleasure uh, having the Q and A again. Thank you, everyone, for the questions that have come through. Um, all it leaves me to do is introduce our next speaker, Elaine Gregg, who is the director at the Renewables Consulting Group. And uh, please keep getting your questions in and enjoy. So thank you very much. Cheers, John. Cheers. Um, hi there, my name is Elaine Gregg. I am director and CTO with the Renewables Consulting Group. Um, my company works in renewables globally um, primarily in offshore wind. What we do uh, for people is support them on management consulting and technical advisory. And what I'm going to show you here is a little insight into how we support people in looking and finding sites and characterizing those sites. Um, so what I've got on screen here is one of the tools that we use. It's the GIS, Graphical Information System uh, tool, um, and it's got a number of public data sets in it. This is very much a subset of what we have um, because this is a very live subject and a lot of what we work with obviously is very confidential um, and we can't show it to you. Uh, but in the UK, we're very advanced in, in our field and the Crown Estate and other bodies, they publish a lot of data and I can show you some of that data and how uh, we think about it and how we view it. Um, offshore wind in the UK, We've just been through a process in England and Wales whereby people have bid in for sites and they've been awarded those sites. So what I'm gonna actually show you here is Scotland um, where the process is still underway and the Crown Estate Scotland is about to go into a process where people are going to bid for and try and secure sites to develop offshore wind farms. Um, my company is involved in supporting people here, but I personally am not. So there is zero risk of me breaching any confidentiality here. Um, and like I say, this is all public information, but it gives you a flavor of what people are currently wrestling with in our field at the moment. So we do this all over the planet, um, but in some countries, data sets are far more difficult to access and uh, they have more value than to get at them. But what I'm going to show you here is Scotland, where the data sets are in the public domain and readily accessible. And most of the developers that are working on this program now will have done the exercise that I'm going to show you now, probably about a year to two years ago. So you can see on your screen here, we have basically a map of Scotland. Um, and I'm showing you here the 12 nautical mile uh, boundary. And we can see on the right hand side, we've put a number of GIS layers. There's quite a lot here. And what we need to do when siting a wind farm is work out where they fit in with all the other constraints and drivers on, on the seabed area. The Scottish programme has put out these pre-selected areas. So these are the areas that people are looking to effectively choose from. So if you're an offshore wind developer, how do you select which is a good area for you to develop? What we also look at here is existing wind farms. So we have a cluster here in the, of existing wind farms, a cluster up in the Moray Firth, and some owners may simply want the site that's next to the wind farm they've already got. These are clearly good sites because they're developable, developed. Um, and do you want to use that precedent? Or do you go somewhere like the Northwest here that's completely different? I'm not showing here England and Wales. Um, this is a, a Scotland filtered data set. So what do we look at for a wind farm? If I take the existing wind farms off, one of the first things obviously we look at is wind speed. So if we look at the key here, the lighter is lower wind speed, the higher, darker is higher wind speed. 
we tend to look at something preferably in the eight to nines minimum to be viable. So that takes out a lot of the, the really inshore areas, which are quite light. But you can see the ideal area is way off to sea. But this is a balance that we have to make. We don't want to be too far away from the country, but we need somewhere that's reasonably windy. Thankfully, Scotland in general is very windy and you can generally find somewhere that's windy enough. What we also need to look at is bathymetry. How deep is it? And that defines what foundations you're able to use. So what we want here is the absolute opposite. We ideally want it relatively shallow, deep enough that a vessel can operate, but shallow enough that you could put a monopile or a jacket foundation. Moving further offshore, you end up with floating foundations and that's more expensive. So ideally we want something up to about 40 meters, which is in this light green area. And you can see again, it's closer to shore, but we have some quite large areas here, here, which they are suitable. We then, in addition to the bathymetry, we look at the other technical conditions that we have to deal with um, on the ground. So uh, let's have a look at what we've got on, on the list from a technical perspective. So we have the substrate data here. And then we have a lot here in the yellow, which is sand, gravelly sand and sandy, muddy gravel. Um, sand is fairly good for uh, us driving monopiles. Uh, so we're reasonably good up here. We have a lot of areas in Japan where you might hit volcanic rock and you can't drive a pile into volcanic rock. So um, it can be prevent us from developing. Um, this is outside of my field of knowledge, but um, we have a lot of people who work in geology and they will tell you a lot about the rock and the strength of the foundation that you have to then design um, and how expensive that foundation is going to be. Um, so if you know anything about geology, you'll probably tell me what a carbonate sedimentary rock is and what a classic sedimentary material is. Um, but what I have is a team of specialist stru structural engineers and they will design suitable foundations for those locations. And they may see, may tell me that I prefer this location over that location because it's an easier foundation design and it comes in cheaper. So we're looking here at the costs of developing uh, a wind farm. There are other more minor effect, uh, technical issues such as uh, UK wave height. Uh, we can't operate vessels if the wave height is excessive. So we look for somewhere that we can manage to operate vessels. Obviously out here in the North Sea, we have a huge oil and gas industry and there's lots of experience in operating within that North Sea. So we don't really have an issue here in the UK, but there are some jurisdictions across the planet where wave height becomes an issue and it prevents us from actually being able to construct and operate wind farms. So those are some of the key drivers on the site. Um, and that's what we as engineers look to, to choose a good site. But there's also things that we need to consider off-site. Um, so if I scro I'm scrolling up and down, I look at the, the grid network. Obviously these are wind farms and we're generating le electricity. Maybe in the future we'll be generating hydrogen or, or something else, but at the moment we generate electricity and we need to find somewhere to export that power to. So this is a map of the grid network provided by National Grid. Um, and you can see here, round the east of the country are 400 kV lines. Up the center, there's a 275 kV line. Um, the key here is uh, on the map. Over on the west, there's nothing at all. So if we want to connect a wind farm, we're looking to try and connect to an existing line. And there are limitations. If I take a measurement here, the distance from the corner of that wind farm to the connection, 67 kilometers. If I take it from this wind farm, 163 kilometers. And as an electrical engineer, that means my electrical design is different 
because for the 68 kilometer connection, I can do a standard AC connection. For 163, I'm looking at something that needs DC or I need something that needs reactive boosters. Now, clearly the distance to land is much shorter, so maybe I can put something there. I'm coming across national park and really difficult terrain here. So I might not want to do that. I might actually, excuse me, sorry, I'll clear that one. I might actually prefer to come to the around the coast to this area at the north. I'm still at 162 kilometers. So I do I need a HVDC solution? Is this a good site for that? It probably needs to be big to warrant that solution. Whereas some of these here, much closer into shore, There we go, 38 kilometers. That's going to be an easy connection. I go back to my data layer, S similar to grid, we need to look at major ports because in order to install a wind farm, we have large vessels with a lot of heavy equipment and large cranes to put the wind turbines in. And then we have smaller vessels that are going out to service these turbines on a regular basis. So we need a port that's got the facilities for the large construction vessels and we didn't other port could be the same port that then takes people to and from the, the turbines to operate them. So we have a number of ports here around the east coast and as I've said before there's a huge oil and gas industry so clearly there's good ports in Scotland. Again in other ju jurisdictions in the rest of the world being close to a port can be a major challenge because they don't have a similar industry baseline to start from. Um, but around the west coast, um, there is a, actually a large port on Lewis, um, but it's, it's not operating at the moment. Um, maybe it can in the future, um, but you're much more limited on the west coast here. So there are technical drivers on site and there are technical drivers off site that you have to consider. And again, we have a huge team of engineers that understand the vessels, they understand operations, they understand the tidal and wave regimes and how these vessels can operate that understand the grid connection, commercial agreements and technical agreements for getting that grid connection. A huge number of engineers coming up with those designs. But when we're doing these, we're not just thinking about the engineering design. We have to also think about how this fits in with all the other users of the sea. So we also have a huge team of environmental and stakeholder management personnel who consider the appropriateness of where we're siting these wind farms. So one of the main things we look at very early on is shipping density. I'm going to take that one off. Um, and so you can see here there's quite a number of shipping lanes. We've got Aberdeen and Peterhead ports up here and shipping going around the top of Scotland and off in various directions. There is a legal traffic routing separation for certain areas. Um, you can just about see those behind the shipping um, where it's protected and you can't actually go with any other works into the shipping lane. But here we're just showing high densities of traffic. So one of these sites looks to be has shipping through the middle of it. Actually, maybe the shipping can go around the edge. Maybe it's not as dense as you might think. Maybe it's a particular type of shipping that could go through a wind farm. You need to find out. But if you chose this site, you don't seem to have that problem at all. Um, so it's often quite a key driver because once you start looking on the map of how much shipping there is, it's huge. We rely a lot on, on international and national trade with shipping. Obviously I've mentioned there's a oil and gas in the area and take off the traffic routes and look at oil and gas blocks. We can see here, these are blocks and you can see where the actual oil and gas wells are with the, the smaller orange here. And co-location is in theory possible. You might have a, an oil and gas well that's coming to the end of its life that could have a secondary use supporting some offshore wind but generally these are parallel industries and you wouldn't overlap an offshore wind farm with oil and gas. You have as long as as well as the oil and gas you have the pipelines 
and we also have power and telecoms lines that we need to avoid. Um, so we can show all these on, on the maps. And you can see over here quite a number of power and telecoms lines. There's power lines feeding the islands. There's power lines here going up to Orkney and Shetland. And there'll be new power lines coming in from the offshore wind farms that preferably don't cross these other lines. But if they do, that's another engineering design that you need to design uh, a crossing to international crossing standards. Preferably, though, we avoid. So the people that are looking after the other stakeholder interests, they're also looking after other interests such as fishing interests. So uh, fishermen use the seas. And again, with wind farms, there are co-location possibilities. You can fish within a wind farm if it's designed safely and to an appropriate method. But sometimes simply you say actually you're, the fishing is excluded from this particular area and that's fine if there's very little fishing there. So it's a consideration and a discussion with the fishing industry. Ooh, yeah, I can obviously zoom in and out. Um, we also have protected areas. So if I put all of these on at once, you can see the marine protected areas, the SPAs, special protection areas, and you can see all of the sites have already been selected here outside of those protected areas. So it's not something that people in this uh, auction uh, are needing to worry about. It's already been taken care of. But if you're looking green field or blue seas, as it were, in another area, it's something that you need to look at to make sure that you're not overlapping protected areas. And there are other tabs on here that we can look at. So. Um, Let's have a look. Uh, disposal sites, not very many close into shore. Aquaculture, not very many in close into shore. So we don't really need to worry about those too much here. Um, but we do need to respect the environmental areas. And even though we have avoided those areas, we still do a full environmental impact assessment. We do a lot of ornithological monitoring, uh, marine mammal monitoring. Um, looking at the seabed for um, ecology on the seabed. There's a huge team of environmental specialists just doing the work to establish that even if we don't have data when we look at the site from the beginning, we do collect that data and make sure that where we're locating these sites is environmentally appropriate. Um, and then there are local issues. Um, so I think one final thing to just throw up. You might be surprised at the number of wrecks there are around the country. And these are potentially grave sites. So again, they need to be respected um, and we would work around them. But we wouldn't work around them on a site basis. We would work around them on a individual turbine basis and each wreck would have a buffer based on what the actual wreck is, how large it is. And, and we would respect that space and leave that alone, typically. There may be some wrecks that you may say, actually, that can be removed and it's economically viable to remove it. Um, but if there is any people in there, then that is a gravesite and it's left alone. Um, so I think uh, that's it. That's a whistle stop tour of some of the things that we have to consider. It's these, like I say, these are publicly available data sets in the UK. Um, and the people who are doing this have done this probably a couple of years ago and then spent quite a lot of time really drilling into all of these factors and talking to the relevant parties, talking to the fishermen, talking to the ports, talking to um, the people who would see it. Um, these things are visible from the shore and you can see 10, 20, 30 kilometres. If you're more than 30 kilometres from shore, you, you really can't see it, it's, it's haze, hazed out, if you like. Um, uh, but if you're close to shore, you're talking to the people that are seeing these things. You're talking to the people that are potentially having landfalls for cable. And you're deciding what the most appropriate site is for you. With all those drivers, what's the best economic for, for you as a company? 
but the most environmentally respectful as well. So hopefully that's of interest and um, maybe an engineering career in one of those aspects. Hello, uh, welcome back. Thank you, Elaine, uh, for an excellent presentation. Um, again, I have to applaud you all. We're getting some absolutely incredible questions through on the Slido. Uh, so please do keep going on there using the hashtag green energy and asking questions, upvoting questions. I'm very happy this time to see that we don't have any, well, we've got a couple of anonymous questions, but you're putting your names to them, so that's good. Um, I think we'll jump straight in. Rania, I promised you in the last session that I would ask your question to Elaine. Um, so Elaine, a nice easy one to start with. Um, could we increase the amount of energy that we share with other countries by increasing cabling and creating a, a kind of a web throughout Europe, bearing in mind there's offshore assets uh, from other countries, um, or is that quite inefficient? That's an, an interesting discussion that's very, very live and uh, I don't know how much you're aware of. So if I go back a little bit, not too recently, we had one connection between Scotland and Northern Ireland and one connection between England and France. And a number of years ago, Eddie O'Connor suggested that exact thing of a huge network just to reinforce ours. Um, and now we have interconnectors to Denmark, to Belgium, to Norway, in planning or being built. And that is starting to build. We have a bit of a problem in our country because of the regulatory framework that we operate under and the competition, which is makes us a bit different from the rest of Europe. And that's not to do with Brexit. That's just the way we operate our systems. So at the moment, we have Tenet, which is a Dutch company really leading the way in developing those offshore networks. And National Grid, our company, is joining with Tenet to try and develop something. It's a very, very live discussion at the moment of how to do this in the best systematic way when you haven't got one party that can actually do an overall design. Um, so a very interesting subject that's very live. Oh, brilliant. Um, as a half Dutch person, I'm very happy to hear that we're leading the way. Um, an interesting question again, so sort of building on that international uh, element, um, Tom has asked, are talks underway to allow us to build wind farms in international waters? I imagine this is probably quite contentious. <laughs> Normal um, domestic waters go out to 12 nautical miles and round one projects were in 12 nautical miles. We are now building projects much, much further out. And if you look at the North Sea, for example, you will see the, the line between us and the Netherlands, the line between us and Norway, and we're each building up to our line. So the bigger issue is perhaps that we all leave room for the shipping to go through which can be somewhere in our waters. But if you look at the North Sea, Dogger Bank is a fairly shallow area of um, the seabed. It's very good for offshore wind. And us and the Norwegians are both going up to our edges of that line. So we are going very much up to that line. However, uh, uh, in Taiwan, they're still up to 12 nautical miles and going to 24 is a bit more contentious because they have a very different political system. I, I can imagine. The less said about that on this one, the better, I think, for the moment. Um, we keep to the UK, shall we? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, quite. Um, Ralph's asked a question here. Um, he's seen concepts for wind turbines suspended high up in the air using balloons. Now, we talked a bit about innovation with John and, and the importance of um, encouraging innovation and, and lots, of, lots of innovative projects being part of a wider solution. Um, but is that something that's feasible? Ah, now feasibility. You never know what's feasible until someone's actually done it. Uh, we are working with someone that's done kite power. Um, and if you go further up into the airstream, there's a lot more wind, there's a lot more energy to capture. So it's something that's worth looking at and worth investigating. Obviously, it's very juvenile at the moment. And the big issue for that is you've obviously got the long strings attaching the kites. And how do other air users interface with those? So I think feasibility is conceptual at the moment, whether it becomes a widespread thing. We'll just have to see if they're successful. A related question from Jonathan, which is possibly getting rid of our cable issue, is can we build wind farms, and we're moving onshore here, which is contentious for a whole other reason. Um, could you build wind farms higher up, like on a mountain or hills? You can, you can. Um, and it again depends where you are, because if you go to Scotland, people don't like to see the wind farms. So it becomes a very <laughs> personal issue. 
and we end up putting them in valleys, which really isn't the best for capturing the wind. But you go to Greece or somewhere like that, you will literally see the wind farms across the edges and ridges of the hills. And you look at the road going up to it and to build a wind farm on land, you have to drive everything up to the top and there's steepness limits on the roads to get things up there. And you look at these things and go, I'm sure that road doesn't meet the steepness <laughs> limit, but they do it and they manage it and they build it. Um, so it becomes very much a matter of the people and the perception of the people and what they will accept in any particular region. Very good. Um, I apologise to Elaine, but I have to look at the, the Slido, which is going mad. So I am I am still listening, but I'm just looking up here. <laughs> um, one good question we've got from, from Morgan. Um, how big of a part do you expect wind energy to play um, in achieving the net zero emissions in the UK? by 2050. So what, what role does wind have uh, in that? Clearly we know there are limitations to wind, but... Yeah, it's got an absolutely huge role because look at what's just happened with Scotland. It had a target for being 100% renewable and I think the number was 97%. It's pretty much renewable just on the basis of wind. But that's where we come back to that very first question. Wind, obviously, it needs the diversity because if you concentrate it in local areas, you may be windy, it may be not. It needs those interconnections to other countries to maintain the strength and support of the system. Otherwise, you need other sorts of uh, generation that when the wind isn't blowing, it can blow. So something more regular and cyclical like solar. Wind is very, very predictable. We know how it's going to work 48 hours in advance, so we can plan the system around it. Um, but it's going to be a very large chunk, but it needs those other elements. No, sure. Um, the next question from uh, Clarice. Now, this is the part of the uh, the day where I admit that I'm not an engineer. So you're going to have to help me out on this, Elaine. Um, do you think superconductivity will be used in the future for large scale electrical transmission if we can make it more efficient? There's a huge amount of research going on into superconductivity at the moment. And uh, I'm sure if you're asking the question, you know the challenges involved in that, but just the volume of research going on at the moment and the people working on it, I, I do believe, yes, it is likely to happen for probably for large, long distance transmission, because that's where it's going to be worth it to spend all that extra money on cooling, not for mm. the, the smaller local stuff. Great. Well, a good question. Um, Rajula has asked, um, how do offshore wind farms affect ocean life and how is this effect minimized? Obviously your, your presentation showed what looked like very, very busy seas. And um, we know, yeah, we know a lot about the importance of sea life and, and, and ocean life. So how, how do you address that from a, from a uh, renewables and wind farm perspective? Yeah, so a large part of getting consent to build a wind farm is to study uh, the flora and fauna. Um, so we do, typically we do two years of marine mammals monitoring beforehand. We'll do a year's worth of looking at uh, fish species and benthic species and look at the fish, etc. And then we will monitor after we've built and it's a feedback loop. So we learn. So we start cautiously, we learn and then we build in the lessons and we build up from there. What we do find actually in some of the large mammals like dolphins, they're really quite interested. And if you build something in the say, sea, they're, they're coming to have a look. They really want a nosy. Um, they're, they're very sensitive on hearing. So that our biggest issue with those is making sure that, you know, we, we sometimes, if we're doing some piling, part of the construction is to make a loud noise to scare them away. So then we do the construction and then they're straight back again. But what we don't want to do is something that's going to hurt them while we're doing the construction. So there's a lot of mitigations in place to make sure that we protect life both during construction and throughout the lifetime. Right. Um, where are we going now? Let's see. Uh, we've got uh, ooh, a very difficult question here. Um, life, cycle duck now. <laughs> life cycle emissions. Um, it's a challenge for um, many, many sectors. How do you think about the carbon needed to build the wind turbine, uh, the wind farm and the, and the maintenance of, the, of that asset? Um, and does it get cancelled out by the green energy that you're creating? Yeah, there's been a number of, I think, academics doing studies on that exact subject. Um, and the carbon payback, it's come down to... 
Now, I haven't looked at this in a few years, so it might have come down even more. But the last time I looked at it, it had come down to three months. So 10 years ago, when we were mainly onshore, it was about six months. Uh, but now they moved to three months. It might even be shorter now because we've got the much, much bigger turbines um, that will generate much more. So it might even be down to a matter of a month or two. And, and I feel it myself because a large part of what I do in development is going to see people and talk about it. And sometimes we're on flights and I'm like, I don't want to be on flights, but I know that the payback is there because once we've got that wind farm up and running within a matter of months, we are net positive or negative, whichever way you look at it. <laughs> we're doing the right thing. We'll keep it positive. Um, that's very, very encouraging to hear. So that's, that's great news. Um, Thinking about future technology um, and the opportunities that the digital technologies afford, um, we've had a question um, asking about AI and the role that AI can have to help site wind farms and, and renewable power plants. Is that something that's in development and, and can it help? It absolutely is. And there's a lot of companies <laughs> doing that exact thing at the moment. Um, there's some companies that work with operational wind farms, um, doing the uh, taking the SCADA data and trying to analyse that data to work out, has something gone a bit wrong? Are the blades slightly misaligned? Is there something we can do to improve? Um, there's other companies um, you know, coming out of MIT developing new technology, amazingly clever technology and computing technology that I don't pretend to understand but they can take a design that would normally take us nine to twelve months through finite element analysis going around in circles and doing it again they can do that in two weeks which just it's amazing it makes things so much quicker and you still yeah. have a timeline that you have to consult and you have to make sure your studies are done and you but just to make it so much more efficient and the opportunities for AI to bring together so many complex aspects into one view and actually then design the whole thing together it means we can put in so many more efficiencies and get much more energy out for the steel and, and carbon that we put in. And presumably that all helps to bring down that, um, that the, the time scale that it needs for that carbon positivity. That, that it brings down the time, it brings down yeah. the cost and it makes everything just better. <laughs> Brilliant. Great question. Um, where are we going now? Um, Claire has asked, once we switch completely to electric or hybrid vehicles, and I suppose the general electrification of the economy that we're starting to see, or the plans to see for, for net zero, um, how long do you think it will take before all the electricity used to power them is renewable? Oh, how long tricky, that tricky. we've got a piece of string question there yeah. but i think we have to go with with the government government targets um and i'm going to admit defeat now i can't remember exactly what the government targets are Don't <laughs> tell me out. 2050 it's net is zero by 2050 yeah net and zero testing me out as well on the electricity yeah i think all electricity comes in before net zero because it does indeed yeah um it's heating networks transport they all follow through so I think by the time the other ones will follow through, the electricity will be all uh, renewable. And then talking of targets, and I've asked this to every single speaker so far, um, because it's an excellent question. Um, do you, Elaine Gregg, believe that we are on track to meet the net zero 2050 target in the UK? I think from an electricity perspective, we are on and ahead of target. We are built, we are conventional now. We're not a new technology. We're not something clever. We are conventional and we are building out renewable electricity throughout. Where I think there's a bigger issue is energy, wider energy, the reliance we have, on, like you say, for cars, for heating houses, for land yeah. use, and the CCC report lays all those out. So I think, yes, in my world, I think Yes, we're, we're well ahead. And I'm now wondering, I maybe should go and get involved in another world to help that forward. Well, thank you very much, Elaine. It's been an absolute pleasure having you here. Um, we now are going into uh, a short 10 minute break, um, but please join us again at 11.50 when we will have uh, some speakers on a panel. So you'll meet some new people and we'll start asking them some of your excellent questions. Um, please do keep them coming in uh, with Slido with the hashtag green energy. Um, but for now, I will see you again live very shortly, uh, but please enjoy your 10 minute break. Thank you very much. Thank you.
everyone and welcome back from your break. I hope you all managed to get a cup of tea or something like that. Um, I'm very happy now to introduce um, our panellists. So we'll have three panellists now and we'll be joined by a, a fourth later on. Um, I'm going to quickly go around the panellists and they will give you a brief introduction of what they do and their kind of areas of expertise. And then we'll have an opportunity for um, rattling through as many questions as we can uh, try and get. Uh, you haven't let me down so far in the Q&As, the Slido has been phenomenal, so please keep that up. Um, as we said, Slido with the hashtag Green Energy, upvote the questions you like uh, and make sure you put your name on. I don't want any anonymous questions this time. Own your question. So I'm going to start with uh, Gabriel. If you'd like to just introduce yourself, give your name, what you do and uh, a brief introduction. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks, James. Um, hi, everyone. I was about to say nice to meet you all, but that's a bit of a weird one. Uh, I'll keep it nice and quick because I hear the questions are very good and I want to hear as many as we can. Um, so I'm a fourth year mechanical engineering master's student at Imperial College London, uh, focusing on research to do with battery supply and grid inertia, if any of you know about that. I'm also working as an engineering consultant for Pivot Power, which is a large grid scale battery developer in the UK who just got bought over by EDF Renewables and their whole slogan is that they want to um, they want to develop, make, and then operate two gigawatts of grid storage battery power uh, in the near future. Um, and also I'm co-founder and CEO of a startup called Honeycomb, which is a micro-mobility startup aiming to develop a network of infrastructure for the micro-mobility transition. Um, I think that's, that's the big headlines that I guess we'll get into a little bit more later. Thanks, James. Wonderful. Thank you, Gabriel. Um, let's go for Helen. Hello, welcome. Thank you. Thanks very much for having me. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I hope you had a good morning. I am Helen and I'm a fourth year material science student at Oxford University. And I'm currently working as a full time academic researcher in um, the electron image analysis group. And what I am researching is this very exciting material called molybdenum disulfide. Um, and it's got applications in photovoltaics, in batteries and in transistors. And it's got some really, really exciting electronic properties, which could potentially up the efficiency of um, PVs and stuff like that. Um, one of the things that I'm really excited about is that I'm using machine learning and neural networks to um, enhance my research. So that's kind of all that I'm doing. I'm using these neural networks to to purely to uh, be applied to the science and it's kind of helped me develop my interest in the, di the digitization of you know the smart grid smart cities you know how we can really drive forward this green energy transition in um, a really smart way and you know how we can integrate all these different sources of green energy that are popping up uh, in the most efficient way so those are my key interests um, and I'm looking forward to any questions that you guys have. Wonderful well we've got quite a few coming in so far but please keep them coming in um, and for the moment, we'll have you one day joining us in a bit, but Alistair, please. Thanks, James. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, I'm a little bit more practical than the other two panellists. I'm a project engineer with Nanosun. Um, my background is in chemical process engineering, and at Nanosun, we design and manufacture hydrogen refueling stations. Um, with our target markets are heavy goods vehicles, uh, forklift, forklift trucks and buses. Um, in my role, I'm generally pretty practical. Um, so we look at um, what the system needs to do and how can we do it. Then we then do process calculations, process modeling, um, piping and instrumentation diagrams, safety studies. So the holistic kind of uh, view of the engineering system. Um, we then also have kind of a, a project management aspect to, to the role in, in project engineering. So we do a little bit of um, schedule management, uh, managing budgets, managing small teams of engineers from other disciplines. So ECNI, mechanical operations, that sort of thing. And then in any time that I have left in my professional life, I also lead two uh, research projects. So we have a research project with Lancaster University where we look at hydrogen purification um, using adsorbent compounds. And then we also have a research project with Manchester Metropolitan University where we're looking at uh, hydrogen fuel quality analysis. So how do you prove that the hydrogen that you're producing at your centralized location, be it SMR, uh, electrolysis, what have you, how do you prove that, that is good enough for a, for a fuel cell? So that is my, that's my job in a nutshell. Brilliant. Thank you, Alistair. I'm going to jump straight in. I'm going to start, unfortunately, by putting one of you on the spot because a very specific question from Jessica has come in for you, Helen. And the question is, what kind of improvements do neural networks and machine learning have to your research? So they really help process essentially large volumes of data. So 
the reason why machine learning has become so important is because advances in another parallel you know um, discipline so in electron microscopes has made acquisition of lots and lots of data possible um, so now researchers are kind of sat there with honestly terabytes of data and there is no way that a human could go through that and kind of using neural networks is a way to process that data very quickly and make the most efficient use of like human time so that is really kind of the smartest way I'd say though the biggest challenge is in terms of reliability of the neural network if you want to be making very firm and you know high confidence um, inferences from your data a level of human expertise is required because the neural network does not know all that I know from my degree and I haven't spent, you know, four years studying material science, but it can, it can really help me and enhance, be used as an enhanced tool. So, so that's where it's really helpful. Brilliant. Um, do, um, does anyone else want to chip in on neural networks or should we, should we go for a slightly more uh, fun and interesting question on, uh, on motorsport that's come through from Jacob? And actually it's quite an interesting question, I think, about um, human behavior and behavioral change. And he's asked, um, when we're trying to achieve net zero targets and what kinds of things happen to, his question's asked, what happens to motorsports such as Formula One, um, NASCAR and MotoGP? But I suppose it's also sort of hinting at what happens to those sort of older, um, more traditional things that we've, we've got used to um, when we're trying to hit, hit net zero. Um, I wonder if anyone on the battery side might be interested or if, if anyone's a particular Formula One fan and they have some strong opinions on this. Um, has anyone got a, a show of hands? For anyone that I, I can jump in for a little bit on this one. Yeah. So I actually have a, an, an interesting colleague of, of mine at work who, um, who's a motorsport fanatic and he actually owns a 1968 Ford Mustang GT, which he ships between the US and the UK as his, as his hobby, he drives it all over the world. And, and his view on this, I think is quite interesting. It's the first one, first approach I'll take is that we're sort of decarbonizing um, the vast majority of, of transport infrastructure such that we can allow the, these, niche, um, these niche areas to expand and for people to enjoy them still, if that makes sense. So the, the fact that we're eliminating carbon emissions from, say, heavy duty trucking and, and manual handling and that sort of thing, it allows people on a small scale to really enjoy uh, these sports and these applications. That's the first thing I'd say. And the second one, I think, is, is it actually creates a vast number of interesting engineering challenges. So there's a number of big automotive players at the moment that are, are active in the hydrogen sector. So particularly Hyundai and, and Honda. And I think it's Hyundai that are looking at um, applications of hydrogen energy into, into motorsport. And then of course, on, on the battery side, I'll let the, the other two guys come in, but it's, um, you, you've got Formula E as well, which presents its own niche challenges and, and how can we compare and compete between fossil fuels and, and new hypercars and things that are coming in on the, on the electric side. And actually, that's a good opportunity. I wonder if I can go to Gabriel with this. Please tell me no. Um, but we've had a question from Morgan, which is, I suppose, related to this Formula E. And, and we know the long history of motorsport and innovation in motorsport. But mm -hmm. the question is, um, how much further do you think current battery technology has the potential to advance, um, uh, I suppose, looking at, uh, at Formula E? So, Gabriel, is there anything you, your thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, battery technology is a huge umbrella um, and there is still loads and there's still a ridiculous amount of research and funding going into it. Um, in terms of formulae, I think that's where, that's the side where we're going to see the most kind of benefit, the most kind of interest, because at the moment, batteries work at a very high efficiency. So realistically, the efficiency gains you're going to get are very marginal. So the stuff that I'm interested in, like large grid scale stuff that doesn't move, that's all I'm not going to say it's it's reached complete maturity, but it's it's nearly there. Whereas the stuff which has lots of applications is where it's space and weight regulated, so especially important for Formula E for passenger vehicles. That stuff has still got leaps and bounds to go. There are so many papers uh, being written about these new cell chemistries, which haven't quite been proven yet, but theoretically have much higher energy densities than we've seen on the market at the moment. Um, so yeah, I'd, I'd say compared to the normal improvements that you see in like f1 and things like that i think formulary still got leaps and bounds um so go ahead brilliant 
Um, Helen, would you like to chip in? <laughs> yeah, I'd also like to jump in and say, obviously with batteries, lots of them are lithium based. And as you guys probably know, lithium is not, you know, the most abundant um, element on our earth currently. We do still have resources, but I mean, it is a constraint that will have to, you know, be taken into account. And whilst other kind of metals can be used as a substitute, that technology is still yet to be developed. So obviously, yeah, as Gabriel was saying, Battery, there are so many different types of batteries, um, whether or not, as he was saying, that they need to be moving in a car or whether or not they're stationary in a house. I would say um, one of the interesting things is actually the um, second life application of batteries. So um, batteries that have been used in electric cars that maybe, you know, um, really um, have a great you know first first life cycle can actually be reused in their second life cycle bmw have just made a battery that can do this and that they have a second life as a stationary battery and um, that can be reused again so learning how to recycle the lithium and all the materials in our batteries that we do currently have is going to be a really important thing to keep track of i think brilliant um as we have had all day you mentioned hydrogen and a few hydrogen questions come in so i'm looking at you alistair here um this is a question, uh, it's, it's related to transport and, and links in quite nicely. So well done everyone for segueing beautifully. Um, would it be realistic to expect aeroplanes to be able to run off hydrogen power in the future? I think this is a fascinating question. <laughs> um, and some of you may be aware of uh, a company which is um, sort of, a, it's a British American uh, heritage called Zero Avia, um, who are working with Airbus and they're backed by Bill Gates and, and Amazon. Um, there's a lot of interest in it. Um, at my company at the moment it is the, or the, the Zero Avia are involved in putting out for tender of how they're going to refuel their first prototype. So they've built a prototype which is capable of carrying, I think it's 19 passengers. Um, so, so work is happening. Um, I think it will really depend on uh, energy density that we can achieve. And at the moment, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a real challenge. But yes, the, there's a, a fascinating scope for, for improvement in that area. Wonderful. Um, does anyone else want to chip in on that? Or are we leaving the hydrogen for Alistair? Uh, well, I, I think guess I just... Sorry, Karen. Sorry, go, 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 Gabriel. Go on, Gabriel. Okay. It's going to be one of those polite things, isn't it? Um, <laughs> I guess I'd... I really like having conversations about hydrogen and all the things that you can do and the massive potential there is in the future. My biggest concern, and frankly, I don't have my own answer to this, um, but I have an inkling, is that it's coming a little bit too slowly and there's so much work that needs to be done in the area. I mean, it's getting funded and financed hugely now, the new EU bills and things like that. They're just throwing money at it. Um, but for, especially for the, the big tagline 2050 net zero target, um, we're going to have to reach some solutions and some integration solutions solutions a lot a lot faster than I think hydrogen tech will keep up economically and technologically wise I don't know if that's a rogue um, a rogue opinion please please do feel free to disagree I think it is it's very suited to certain niches I mean uh, so I spoke earlier about the fact that in, you know in my my current job we're looking very specifically at areas where um batteries and, and fossil fuels aren't really capable of um, providing that net zero solution or they're not the optimal perhaps net zero solution but ultimately I think and there's a lot of uh, stuff in the press about this at the moment that, that these two technologies um, I don't think they should be competing we are fundamentally trying to achieve the same goal and it's really about how we can work together to to integrate them into the same solution so I think um, for, for aviation it's a particular challenge because the hydrogen is obviously is your uh, energy vector on, on board the system whereas you still need the fuel cell and then the battery to actually drive the electric motor so it's a it's a it's a, um, it's a linear process and that's and they have to work together in that way so they're, they're codependent technologies. Agreed. Yeah, I would add on that. It, it's exactly what Alistair was saying, that it's dependent on several things being able to happen at the same time. But what's more realistic as a scenario is that those different technologies progress at slightly different rates. Um, and that might make the feasibility of it slightly hard um, and to, as a reality to, to have. And I think, yeah, as, as um, Alistair was saying about the competition, between these two things and it shouldn't be a competition it shouldn't be a competition at all it's all about integrating and I think one of the biggest challenges is how you actually balance the demand um to kind of make sure that the ideal consumer you know what the consumer needs for energy wise is actually being met perfectly kind of much more in harmony than currently is being done um we've had a very nice question and I, I think it will be um quite a nice contentious one to have a little think about but obviously we're we're spending a lot of today thinking about the future and, and bringing off fossil fuels off and thinking about new technologies and, and 
and renewable. We had a lot of people talking about renewable energy. Um, Jonathan's asked, are there any contexts where non-renewable energy is acceptable? So I'll be interested to hear if, if there, and I, I know with the hydrogen um, <laughs> piece, I wonder if, if that's that seen, but um, does anyone want to start with that one? It's a bit of a, a nice discussion piece. I think I'll jump in Go if on. that's where they're on. Um, I think potentially in the future, I want to say no. Um, and that's a very strong stance and I'm taking that so people can disagree with me. But <laughs> I, uh, fossil fuels are extremely useful as a transitional piece. Uh, I think especially when you switch to cleaner, gradually cleaner things like gas and then you go on. Um, I guess the big challenge is actually not renewable and uh, renewable generation now. We can, we can do that perfectly fine and actually very commercially um, viably now. Uh, the, the people who own wind farms and solar farms are making huge amounts of money. But the real challenge that we're seeing on the grid and actually the, the world actually is seeing on their grids individually is this challenge of all the new, all the new intermittency and the specific technologies used for new renewables, especially the inverter types, are making the grid very unstable and not just on an hourly level, but on a second level. So I'm not sure if people have, know masses about um, how, grid, how the grid is maintained at 50 hertz as a frequency and the rate of change of that. Um, is a big contentious point at the moment because it's dependent on how much inertia we have on the system um, and system inertia traditionally has come from big fossil fuel plants with large turning generators that are electrically coupled to the grid and as we take more of those off what effectively happens is that that frequency plunges and rises way too quickly for the system the control systems we have at the moment to keep up um, so that's really, I think, the big integration challenge that, that we're facing at the moment. How can we, even as we take off more and more fossil fuel plants, how can we keep that system stability up? Um, and if everyone's interested, there's lots of work being done on virtual synchronous inertia, synchronous compensators, or it's just a lot of tag, lines that, uh, tag words that I'm using now so people can research them if they're interested. Um, but I think that's where the challenge is. And in the bridge over, that's where fossil fuel plants are still going to be required. Um, while that technology isn't commercial and isn't deployed at a large enough scale. Herb. I'd quite like to say I completely agree, but I just think we just have to take a stance of no. And then if you say no, then everything will happen. You know, then the policy will be in place, the, the money will be invested, the transition will be shorter, the we'll be able to we'll be able to, you know, build a better grid for the stability, have better reliability, be able to all of these things will happen when you just very firmly say no we're cutting that out so um yeah no i completely agree like it's an inevitability because we can't just cut off the power right now like we still need it um which is an interesting thing i, I did a bit of work bp and they often get a lot of questions you know asked at their employees like well how can you justify the fact that you're still looking for oil and you're still kind of you um employing so much in well engineering um but their argument is, well, the energy demand currently exists. You can't just say, no, we're turning off now. The, the whole you know, society will collapse if you don't have enough energy. But I think really, really strong regimented policy will be the key driving force to make sure that we um, really accelerate this change. And it is very, very urgent. So, yes. Alistair, I wonder if you got um, any thoughts to this? Um, unfortunately, I, I agree as well. And I think the... Um, the, the way I would look at it perhaps is, is slightly different. I think it, it, it looks like, particularly for people who are of the, you know, the engineering persuasion, like, like we, are, we all are, it, it's really a challenge to, to, to be met um, by our profession. I think the only people that are going to be able to solve this are, are people, fundamentally those who are providing the technical solutions. Um, and, and it's something that we should, we should embrace and, and look forward to as, a, as an opportunity for us in the green sector. Um, very quickly then, as a, as a kind of uh, additional a question to that for you, Alistair. David has asked, what are, what are the biggest things holding the advancement of hydrogen power back? Is, is that a, are there things that you sort of look at to say, right, how do we get to the future that Helen's talking about and doing things quickly? From your perspective for hydrogen, what are the things that are that are holding it back the most? And you're Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, so there, there's two there's two things I can think of. I mean, the first one, it, you know, that which gets thrown thrown at hydrogen quite quite regularly is um, is its intrinsic properties. So the fact that it is the it, its density is ridiculously low. Um, it's very difficult to handle. It will escape from whatever you're trying to contain it into. There is there is no way that you can keep it all in there. Um, which is a challenge. And then it, its flammability and explosive limits are, are huge. So you have to be very careful with it. 
I think these things can all be addressed. I mean, if you look at um, the risks associated with petrol stations and things, if, you know, in certain um, reviewing the, the hazards associated with petrol station and uh, boiling liquid flammable vapor explosions and things like that we've had in the past, the risks aren't dissimilar. Um, and there's a lot of experience, a lot of work going on to address that. Um, so I, I don't think, I don't view those as being insurmountable. I think the more immediate challenge that's facing us as an industry is, is really compliance and, and protocols and how we, we work together. Um, so what I mean by protocols is when you, when you turn up to a petrol station, um, everybody knows what to do. It, it, it's instinctive. You, you pick up the, the handle, you put it in your car, you press the button, and then you go, you go and pay. You know? And at the moment, because of the challenges associated with hydrogen, the fact that it's flammable and that you've got to make certain type, pressure tight connections and how you store it and that sort of thing, there isn't yet an industry-wide way of doing it. Um, it varies between country, so particularly the European Union has certain sets of standards, which we tend to conform to, and then the US Department of Tran Transportation has, a, has another set, and you've, as, a, as a business like ours, you've really got to be able to uh, conform to both if you're going to be successful, so the fact that there isn't currently a, a holistic approach to how we actually put the, the nozzle into the car, that's, that's the biggest challenge that we're facing at the moment. Great, thank you, Alistair. Um... Unless Helen or, or Gabriel, you'd like to jump in, we've we've got a question, um, our most popular question at the moment. Um, and I, I, I'm assuming I don't know quite, but I, did you all go through the Arkwright Scholarship? Uh, there we go. I I knew that. Um, so the question is then for you: How did you go from being an Arkwright Scholar to getting where you are today? Uh, who wants to start with that? Helen? <laughs> oh, sure, I'll take it. Um, yeah, so I was an art correct scholar in 2015. Um, and from then, I had quite an early interest in energy. Um, and I might have wanted to go to the national grid, um, which meant that I got very exciting trips to their offices in the Leamington Spa. And I got to see, you know, all the, the offices and their, they've, they've got like a grey sort of metal building with no windows where they control the grab power from and no one can see inside because it's such a high security risk. Um, so I think I started to understand from there how important energy was. But yeah, Outcry gave me such a great starting point and just a, such a great community um, to really feel like I could embrace my ideas and explore it. So I took that and then went to university and I knew I wanted to study like an engineering topic, but I was interested in things at the nanoscale. So material science was kind of perfect for me. Um, so I do a lot of like, you know, nanoscience sort of scale engineering. Um, rather than, you know, a typical bridge, I'm looking, you know, at the molecular scale, how exactly is the material that we're using, the concrete and all of this stuff are gonna help. Um, um, and yeah, I think the process has been, I guess it's been quite intuitive because just being in touch with and kind of keeping up to date with what's going on in the scientific world, but also what's going on in the engineering world and being present for challenges and stuff like that has made kind of the, the whole transition from being an art Christ scholar and being 16 years old to kind of now working in academia and working with the people at the top of the pipeline of research. Um, really, really, I, I guess, a quite smooth process. Um, so I would encourage you all to take advantage of the art Christ community and it has so much to give and ask as many questions as you can. Brilliant. Uh, Gabriel, Alistair? You were like yeah, yeah, I could jump in next. Um, so my path is sort of a, a little bit different and perhaps slightly longer. Um, I was an alumni in 2012. Um, um, I then went to university in Edinburgh to do chemical engineering. And I spent six months working in research in a Swiss, Swiss institute looking at polymer sciences. Um, and then I sort of fell into, fell into the company that I met the, the managing director through running. Um, bizarrely, um, and he, we, I was employee number 12, and we, we've tripled in size since I joined in 2019, so we've been there for two years, and we're, we're now a team of, of 30 hiring all the time, and we've got six positions open at the moment. Um, so I think outside opportunities can be can often be a way of, particularly if you live in a, in a smaller area, can be a way of meeting people and connecting and, and finding out about shared interests. I think from the scholarship point of view, the things I really got from it were the, the when I was part of the mentoring program, it really affords you insight into the opportunities that are available in, in engineering. Because I think when you're at school, you you don't quite um, get that understanding of what, what is involved in a typical day job. What what do you do day to day? How, how do you how do you come about with these solutions? You know, you kind of see the BPs and the shells, etc., on the news, but then. 
there's a network of smaller companies beneath beneath the large organizations that you don't see quite so much. So that that mentoring process allowed me to peel back the surface and um, and, and have a look at what's going on underneath, which I think was really helpful. Brilliant, uh, Gabriel. Yeah, I'd 100% agree with Alistair there that it, it gives you an in industry insight that you would otherwise not have in secondary school. And my big takeaway, so I was an Arkwright scholar, I think 2015 as well, Helen. Um, sorry, I don't, we, we haven't spoken since then, but, <laughs> but uh, um, it's what I think I took from it and going to, going to some of these networking events and these, having that mentorship is that um, I used to really idolize industry. So as a student, I always thought that it was very difficult to communicate with industry and I, I was always worried about like getting things wrong and things like that. But after having spoken to some of them, it, it's, not that, like, it's not that it made me realize that some people in industry have no idea what they're doing, but they definitely, uh, don't, they definitely don't have that absolute knowledge that you think they do. It's all very based on opinions and thoughts and they're always very much, um, and what struck me is that they always really welcome discussion and even if you don't know a lot about it, often people who work on things are more than happy to discuss it. Um, and I think that was really uh, a coin drop the whole moment in my life that helped me to get, well, the job that I have at the moment. So I got the pivot power job very, I want to say not, um, I approached it in a very odd way, I suppose. Uh, I reached out to the business director of the company through LinkedIn, just asking some questions because I, it, it wasn't clear how they explained certain concepts on their site and certain ideas and asking about what they thought about the future of the energy transition and that kind of thing. And from that, they just invited me in for a coffee. I had a coffee with the business director and he was like, oh, you know what? You should talk to our engineering director. He brought Adrian, the engineering director in um, and that spun out very quickly into an internship and then a part-time role and uh, now a, a role as a consultant. So it, it's really, where I came from the Arkwright bit was, was kind of humanizing industry um, and gaining that confidence to be able to just reach out. And you should absolutely, if you have any questions for any specific company, if you're interested in a specific company, just reach out to them. LinkedIn is an amazing tool that didn't exist a couple of years ago. Um, and you'd be surprised at how many people reply to their LinkedIn from people from, well, re people who reach out who they just don't know as well. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's I great. definitely um, concur with Gabriel on that point. I think that LinkedIn is a, is a fantastic tool. I think one thing to be aware of when, when you're giving it a go is the, the importance of a bit of a personal message. I think if you just send somebody uh, a connection request, it's highly unlikely that they're, they're going to respond to you. I mean, I've, I've been on both sides of this myself when I've sent one randomly and, and not been accepted and somebody sent one randomly to me and I've kind of thought, oh, what, why have you done that? You know, <laughs> it, And then you sort of, it gives you a bit of a different perspective. So I'd always recommend absolutely going for it, but making sure you have a little note on there that explains who you are, why you're interested in what this person is doing and what you think you can you, you can benefit from in, in this relationship. If, if there's anything to be there going forward, that would be my advice. Just Brilliant. on the end, yeah, just on the Sorry. end of that, I'd, I'd tag on a question on the end. Um, questions are always easier to answer instead of like, hey, I like your work. That's it. Uh, please connect. Yep. <laughs> if you have a question to, for them to answer, they'll, they'll connect and answer. Brilliant. Thank you, guys. Um, I'm very happy to introduce uh, Yvande Akinola, who is just about to join us. Um, so bear with us one second while she joins the, the grid. And joins, hopefully. Hiya. Hi, uh, Hi Yuande. Thank you for joining. You're, you're with the Arkwright Scholars, so thank you. How are you? How are you guys? <laughs> <laughs> um, so we've got the Arkwright Scholars all watching on YouTube. Um, oh, great. I hope, could you possibly give us a brief introduction uh, as to sort of two, three minutes about uh, your your role and what you do in engineering and the thing the things that you're passionate about? And then we'll We'll go back to some of the great questions that we're getting on Slido. Oh, that's brilliant. Well, hi, everybody, and huge apologies for being massively <laughs> delayed joining you. Um, my name is Yoandi Akiola, and it's a real pleasure to be here with you. Um, and first of all, I really would like to say big, massive, well done to everybody who is watching now. Um, I'm extremely proud of all the incredible work and the efforts that you know, a lot of young people, including yourselves, have put in over the last, you know, year especially. Um, my name is Yoandi, as I said, I'm an engineer. I like to call myself a design engineer as well as an innovator. I'm, I've worked in the built environment. So designing some of the buildings that you probably see around, a lot of the buildings that you're probably not in at the moment, um, all around the world. 
Um, I've worked on airports. I've worked on, um, you know, hotel buildings, super high rise buildings, schools, um, designing them from a water perspective, from a mechanical perspective, uh, from a sustainability perspective as well. So um, I'm sure you know a lot about, you know, um, sustainable design or you've heard it, um, the word sustainability, how we use materials, how we ensure that we're building for many years to come. So my work is pretty much in that area to be able to ensure that we're making the most of the resources that we have to create incredible spaces to live in. Um, and that work is taking me all over the world, which is really exciting. Um, you know, I've worked in this country, I've worked in, in the Far East and lived there as well. I've worked in, on projects, you know, in the Middle East as well and worked in projects in Africa. So I'll, I'll pause there and hopefully we can get some questions come through. Wonderful. Well, um, we're going to go for a question and um, Max has asked this and there were a couple of questions throughout the day that have been quite similar. Um, but it's an area where I know that I'm working on quite hard around uh, future skills and looking at areas of... Um, professions where perhaps the future does looks quite uncertain because of net zero targets. So um, I think it's worth worth looking at this specific, particularly because um, everyone we've got on the panel here sort of went to slightly different bits of engineering. But Max has asked, um, will certain areas of engineering, such as petroleum engineering, um, be useless or could they ever reach sustainability targets through an intermediary step? And I think on top of that, sort of looking at engineering in general and, and we've had a question about generalisms and specialisms and your path through the engineering profession so I, I can imagine it's quite particularly for the people watching it, it's quite uncertain as to where we're going so you and I wonder if we could go to you first to put you on the spot straight away <laughs> yeah rightly so rightly so I deserve <laughs> it <laughs> yeah I was just gonna say you know um I, so our, our world you know and all the different countries in our world right are different um, points in their journeys towards sustainability, right? Um, and, you know, some countries are, you know, more advanced, you know, some countries just because they are in certain locations, they can explore, you know, different types of energy uh, uh, sources. Um, and, and so I feel um, that we would always, you know, for as long as, you know, you know I would be around, we would always see, you know, solutions that are pretty much a mishmash of what is available, right? You know, there are countries that can't really afford to rely on, you know, um, wind, for example, right? Um, and in those instances, it would be unreasonable to insist that they close their eyes to, you know, their petroleum resources, especially if there's a you know, depository of, you know, some form of natural resource that allows that to happen. Now, the idea behind sustainability, and it's really exciting, is really looking at things through a very objective lens to say, actually, for this country, what is the best solution, right? Is it a bit of wind combined with the bits of solar combined with the bits of petroleum? Right. Um, and, and as such, I think that most countries would go down that route. And to a certain extent, that would make petroleum still relevant. You know, in this country, we're trying to move away from that because we know that, you know, a lot of the activities of some, some of the big energy companies are actually outside, you know, outside the, 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 the boundaries of this country. Um, so I think it would still be relevant. Um, hopefully scaled back. But the great thing about innovation, right, is the fact that people can use their intelligence to evolve industries. And that is what I'm excited about, to see the evolution of the petroleum industry, to see how it becomes more innovative, more exciting, more resourceful, and more sustainable. Brenda, can I jump in there? I, I have a specific example of exactly what you're talking about. Um, there's, there's a fantastic company um, operating in Canada at the moment uh, called Proton Technologies, mm -hmm. and they are working in exactly the area that you're talking about. So th their whole principle behind this business is to take um, spent oil and gas wells 
and you, you inject a mix of oxygen and carbon dioxide into the, beneath the surface um, and you have a membrane that covers the, the exit. And what happens is it's called in situ gasification and you, you get hydrogen comes through the membrane. So you're, you're reusing all of those skills of the existing workforce mm. who, are, who are petroleum engineers and geologists and you're transforming the, the, the old use of a, of, a, of a natural resource and you're producing something completely clean and, and new and, and innovative as, as you say with it. So I think it's really exciting as you say that there's, there's actually examples of this happening all over the world at the moment. I, I wonder if I could, That's brilliant. Really sorry, well. I wonder if I could ask Helen and, and, and Gabriel who are still fourth, I think you both said fourth year students are so still sort of within academia. So I mean, if you are 16, 17 as an engineer now and you're looking at specialisms, I wonder if, if you can give any of your experience about how your sort of journey through engineering is flexible or, or what, any decisions that you sort of made, which, which may help to uh, ease some of the, the, the stress or anxiety there may be that you might be picking something that, that might not exist anymore. But Helen, I wonder if I could start with you. Yeah, I would say at the stage where you guys are at in your education, so when you're 16, the doors are all still completely open to you. There's so much out there. And I think one particular spending three years of your life, maybe on a particular sort of engineering, you're still going to have to be studying general engineering and you're going to be picking up very, very key transferable skills and just kind of the ability to learn and pick up new knowledge. Everyone is going to have to be learning throughout their careers. It's not kind of like you finish university and that's sort of it. It's such a dynamic um, environment that that it's really the skill of knowing how to learn and pick up new information, which is the most important thing. So if I think anything should be worrying you, that should be making sure that you can really, you feel like you know how to learn and you keep your natural inquisitiveness. I'd say like, particularly for my topic, I mean, I study material science, it's such an interdisciplinary area. And I, you know, I mentioned earlier, I'm using machine learning now. I had to pick that up. I didn't study computer science. So I had to start learning about AI and machine learning and then apply that to my domain expertise, which is back in this battery material. So I think it's a really good example of how I don't think you should be too worried about, you know, the very specific, oh, should I pick chemical engineering, or mechanical engineering or civil? I, I think all the doors are open to you, just keep an open mind, um, keep exploring. And I think increasingly we'll see that the, the lines between these two areas will start blurring. So um, yeah, just make sure you keep learning, I think would be my piece Brilliant. of work. Thank you, Gabriel. I mean, I'd 100% agree with Helen. Um, and some of the things, I mean, if you think about it, maths never really changes. So any, any skills that you learn in that kind of sense, they're all gonna be transferable and applicable and true, uh, even in a couple of years. The, I guess the way I'd bridge it over is that Helen said you always have to be learning and there's always something new and that's absolutely true and it's not just true in academia but it's also true in industry especially with the way the industry is transitioning at the moment. I think the absolute biggest skill that employers and I've seen to be the most useful thing um, to bridge over into industry is the ability to learn very quickly new concepts and new things. Um, the example I'd give is that I'm currently working with a lot of senior analysts on the energy markets in the UK and analysing them. Um, and the energy markets that are now that are now functioning in the UK are completely different from the ones that are what well, were functioning about five years ago. For example, there's a new um, there's a completely new frequency response market the National Grid came uh, come out with called dynamic containment. And the thing is, with exp uh, when you compare my experience with the people that I'm working with, I have so much less. But I've read all the documentations on this new market so I know pretty much the, ex uh, the exact same amount as them for this new bit um, and that's going to become more and more true as new policies come up that change the way we do things um, as new green deals go through uh, and so yeah absolutely the, I, I wouldn't be worried at all about picking something now and having to flip later because the, re uh, the realistic thing is that you're probably going to have to learn completely new set of skills anyway by the time you guys get out. Sorry if that's worrying. I didn't, didn't mean for it to sound worried. Um, but yeah, don't feel stuck in in, in what you choose. Brilliant. Um, does do anyone else want to want to chip in on that on that point, or should we have? Uh, we've got one one more minute actually. So I might I might just ask one quick question, which I've asked all of the speakers that we've had so far. It's a nice easy question, mm -hmm. um, but um, obviously we're looking towards the future, and in the UK at least there are net zero targets for twenty fifty, and I wonder. Um, do you think we're on track to meet these net zero targets? Oh, <laughs> that was a nice, easy question. Nice, easy <laughs> one to end on. Oh, I so suppose <laughs> for gut reaction, how do you feel? Great. <laughs> right. We'll start with you, Yuande. 
<laughs> okay, th thank you very much, James. <laughs> right, okay, right, okay. Right, how do, how do I put this, right? I, I think with, with, with targets, right, it, there's, there's, there's always two different parts that actually need to come together, you know, to, to give you a fighting chance. Um, and obviously one is passion, and the other part is action, right? Um, and I am definitely seeing, you know, um, the passion bits start to kind of do this. Um, you know, you know, I, I speak with people in, in, in consultancies, in, in engineering organizations, um, you know, I speak to people in government and, you know, there is definitely that growing ambition to hit our targets. Now, the question is how much of our actions, you know, are, are actually living up to us being on track, right? Um, and that I'm sorry, I don't have an answer to because <laughs> I feel we need to do more work. You know, I personally feel that we need to do more work. I mean, the IIT, for example, uh, published, um, you know, a report recently to show how much skills shortage there is um, and how much work needs to happen to ensure that our workforce is skilled up to be able to deliver our targets. And if people are not holding that report and really living by every single word in it, you know, I don't think the action would follow through to push us to where we are. So I think, you know, on one side of it, yes, we are. But on the other side, there is definitely still a lot of work to be done. We can't rest our eyes. <laughs> Is there, did you have anything you'd like to add to that? I think that was pretty comprehensive from, from you, Wanda. I'd probably be slightly more um, pessimistic. I think the short answer at the moment is probably no. Um, I think that there's good examples out there. So I, I mentioned that when I joined my current business in 2019, there's only 12 of us and there's now 30 and we're projected to be at 40 people by the end of the year. So, and if you know, if you, if you map out that trajectory, we're expanding massively. And I think that's true for a, certainly a lot of hydrogen businesses. And I suspect um, the other two perhaps can comment on this as well. That's true in, in battery electric sector. These sectors are the biggest hires at the moment. People, that there are jobs in these areas. And if that is indicative of anything, then it, it is indicative of the fact that we're, we're moving in the right direction. Gabriel? Yeah, it's, it's a really interesting and charged question. I think no one knows the answer at the moment, and it's all about how the next couple of years pan out for me. Um, COVID, no matter how disastrous and That's the first COVID yeah. mention. That's oh, the first COVID really? Mention. Oh, I'm <laughs> so sorry. Nearly got through the day without one. <laughs> Nearly got through the day without one. My bad. Um, it has been horrendous on so many accounts, but it has really been a kick in the right direction for the Green and Climate Initiative. Um, I think I saw a stat the other day, and half the statistics you see are not true anyway, but I think I saw the stat the other day that if we continue the decrease in carbon generation that we saw over the COVID period, over the rest of the next 10 or so years, we'll hit that 2050 target quite comfortably. Um, and that actually says to me that we can do it, but massive, not only industrial uh, and political change needs to happen, but also behavioral change needs to continue. Um, and whether... Well, uh, what the post-COVID world looks like and whether that's feasible, um, I don't know. Uh, but I, I, I think it's a, good, it's a good sign that we could get there. Brilliant. And finally, Helen, any closing remarks from you? Yeah, I would say maybe to be a little bit optimistic. The, I think COVID-19 <laughs> has shown us you can produce, if everyone in the world puts their minds together, you can produce a vaccine in one year and get it out in record time. And it's just about the urgency. So I think the real kind of rate determining step is everyone in society really getting behind it. And I can tell that obviously the engineering community is so passionate about this cause, but you may be disappointed to find that you go over to maybe a financial sector or somewhere else and you can see the investors aren't just putting the money in, in those, in the right companies. Um, and I guess they're all linked to each other. I mean, policy as well, that and drives investment and then that will drive technology. But um, yeah, I think it's very dependent on who we have um, in power and in government across all the different countries and how they work together. Um, but I think it can be done, hopefully. If, if there's a large enough driving force, I, I am optimistic. Thank you, Helen. Well, um, that point actually leads me on quite nicely to, to finish off the day, but 
from that policy and government perspective, my, my own personal involvement, I do um, uh, government policy work at the IET on science, uh, on sort of engineering issues, and, and you're completely right. I'm, I'm very lucky to work with really, really high quality engineers on a daily basis and, and, and get their information. And even though I'm not an engineer, I'm, we're able to use that information to try and drive change and make sure that engineers' voices are heard. Um, because as I think Alistair said earlier, um, it's engineers that will be providing the solutions and it's engineers that will be able to, to really push us on towards net zero. So um, for all of you out there, I, I'd like to thank all the speakers that we've had. I think it's been a really, really brilliant session and a really, really brilliant sort of half day. I'd like to thank everyone at Arkwright who's involved um, and has been involved with the organising and obviously the, with the scholarship. Um, brilliant thank you to IET TV, particularly Lee and Mike, who you have been able to see but have been on my screen all day keeping us regular and, uh, and keeping us running. Um, and most of all, I'd, I'd like to thank you all for working so hard to get <laughs> Arkwright scholarships and particularly in, in a very challenging year. And I, I hope from my non-engineering background, I hope to run into to some of you across the next few years as I try and work with you to, to help us reach those, reach those net zero targets. So um, please visit the IET, the Institution of Engineering and Technology, go and look at what we're up to, look at what the speakers are up to, have a bit of a research and, and keep the passion. Um, so without much further ado, uh, I will let you go and have some lunch, but thank you very much for, for joining us today. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure. Cheers, everyone. Thank you.